You better be listening to Slezoids or I must break you. Once courageous knights roamed the land, searching for adventure, ready to brave any challenge. Knight Riders. The knight is a fighting machine, disciplined in mind and heart, and noble to the death. Magic got to do with the soul, man. All the soul got destiny. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise. And at the end of each episode, along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. Next week, we're talking a very specific comedian going action mode. So join that sleaze. That's right. We decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an on-air shout out and two bonus episodes every single month, which I just found out that we have been doing uh, for, I think, 160 plus now bonus Dang. episodes, as well as our bonus transmission series where we talk about new release genre films, which we have over 50 of. So if you haven't made the jump yet, patreon.com slash Lizoids podcast. There is now way over 200 bonus episodes waiting for you over there. And speaking of which, we did have quite a few people make the jump this week, bringing in their shout outs here we had andy bell sign up we had jesse custer we had mark barone ben delulis uh, robert denler keski paul b nico nick manslank richard paul listalo butchered name number six which i think is a reference to my pronunciation of names uh wine mum james lj jake baldwinson and last but not least eric Zelinski. so thanks so much to all of you folks we appreciate the support hope you're enjoying those bonus episodes yeah thank you very much guys that's the one plug for the week. The other plug, as always, is Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you were listening to the show on either one of those platforms, and I can see the stats, I see you right now listening on both those platforms, give us a good old rating and a review over there. It helps us climb the ranks and find new listeners. And the last plug, as always, is merch. If you like the poster art that based out of Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for our show, you can get that put on basically anything that you guys can think of. And you freaks have thought of a lot of stuff. You've bought notebooks, you've bought pillows, you've bought hoodies, coffee mugs. If you're interested in that, the link is in the description of this episode, as well as over at sleezoidspodcast.com. But that is it for the intro. Welcome back to another week. As always, I am your host, Josh Lewis, and joining me also, as always, is my co-host, Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. I believe uh, two weeks ago would have been the last time you folks over on the main feed would have heard from us, and we would have had our uh, one of our resident trashy B-movie experts, Oliver Leach, back on the podcast, which I forgot to mention to him two weeks ago, but I, I think he is he might have the record for bringing on the most films like with sub-500 logs on Letterboxd. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Some of my favorites. That's why we love him, and he didn't disappoint two weeks ago when he brought a Doctor-themed episode called Doctor. <laughs> Dr. Gore from 1972 and Dr. Death from 1973, both movies about mad scientists slash magicians who try to bring dead wives back from the dead by murdering uh, other women. Uh, both uh, were connected by mute monster assistance, creepy gender politics, uh, <laughs> and an, an honestly fairly graphically gory uh, for the early 70s uh, violent sequences. Uh, just one in like a more Ed Wood meets Herschel Gordon Lewis kind of way. And yeah. the other one in a like more campy 70s TV movie theatricality uh, with John Considine as this just maniacally flamboyant uh, Dr. Death character. Oh, yeah. Just chewing the scenery. He's having so much fun. And uh, I think it was it Dr. Gore, the one that's a little more Ed Wood esque. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, the, uh, the gore is great. It's just a little bit padded out on its on its story. But uh, the gore is pretty good. I'll give it that. Yeah. Uh, so if you haven't heard that episode, that was uh, two weeks ago over on the main feed. Go back and check it out. Uh, but last week over on the Patreon, we had your guys' patron voted episode 
episode uh, where once every two months we have our patrons nominate the double feature they want us to talk about. The most upvoted one gets covered on the show, and which means that the next round of nominating and voting is actually happening right now, probably. So get over there and get your double features uh, ready. Uh, but last week's came courtesy of our patron Knuckle Scraper, uh, and it was a double feature of two distinct American auteurs taking on the dark underbelly of suburbia. We talked about David Lynch's foundational neo-noir horror melodrama Blue Velvet from 1986, which we went quite long on because it's just one of the best movies ever and <laughs> it lays so the groundwork cool. for so many of Lynch's career-long obsessions and collaborators and fetishes. And we paired it with John Waters' uh, attempt to to go mainstream with the old fashioned sort of housewife satire turned slasher comedy serial mom from 1994, which is just a wonderfully strange movie with such a committed and demented central performance from Kathleen Turner as the uh, picture perfect homemaker turned psychopathic mass murderer. Yeah, you'd think it'd be body heat that made me completely committed to being in love with her, but somehow it was serial mom, you know? But it's, yeah, yeah it's fantastic. Yeah. She defended the right of all men to watch Herschel Gordon Lewis movies in their bedroom. <laughs> Hell um, yes, queen. And she killed people for not rewinding their tapes. It was all very relatable stuff. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> we agree with this. A couple of the decisions made. We like serial, serial mom. mom. We were pro serial mom. Yeah. yeah. So if, <laughs> if you are interested in that episode, that was last week over on the Patreon feed. Go back, go check it out. But moving on to this week, we are joined by a very special guest. He is a documentary filmmaker whose uh, unique style blends nonfiction subjects uh, and very eccentric real world personalities with a very subjective formal shooting and editing style. And his movies include uh, Some Kind of Heaven, which premiered at Sundance and Sperm World, which was at True False and recently came out on Hulu and FX. And his latest is an incredible miniseries on uh, HBO produced by the Saturday. Afty Brothers Alara Pictures called Renfair, which I will let him tell you guys a little bit about briefly. But that guest is Lance Oppenheim. Lance, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? Hey, I'm good. It's an honor, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, this we're incredibly excited to, to to have you. When you cold reached out to the podcast uh, email with links for us to check this out, I was like, what is this? And then I watched it and I was like, Jamie, you need to watch this right now and we need to yes. talk to this guy. <laughs> well, that was, that's very nice. I'm glad I'm glad you responded. I uh, <laughs> no, I've, been, I've been following you guys for a while. Oh, I'm, awesome. uh, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good, man. I'm I'm a. Uh, how does it feel to have the show out there? Everyone should be watching it, but Renfair is 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 done. The response is in. How are you feeling? I I think I'm good. It's hard to <laughs> you know. It's always hard to tell with these sort of things. It's like because it's not physical. It's all digital. I I find mm. myself like totally glued to my phone, but then I get migraines when I try and <laughs> uh, read things about it, and you know. But but I, I I'm very proud of I'm very proud of it, and I'm proud of the work we were able to do, and and so it's it's nice to see. Uh, at least it's rippling, you know, having have people engaging with it. It's interesting to see it even having effects in the in, in our you know subjects' lives. Um, they all mm. really loved it, and they all just were interviewed by Vanity Fair. And Amazing. I know that was it's the talk of the town in Texas. Is uh, <laughs> the the contents of that interview? It's it's really interesting to read, and um, it kind of went into the whole you know process. So I'm glad they were able to do that. But uh, I'm, good. I'm a little I'm a little hungry. I may, I'm in a I'm in a hotel room. Uh, I'm shooting a commercial, and so I may uh, while we're doing this, I may order some uh, room service. Oh, see do if that. They, uh, the Hilton. See if they got any turkey it. legs or anything. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe something lay, laying around. But yeah. no, I'm really excited to be here with you guys and 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 talk these uh, two movies. Oh yeah, Should I reveal what they are or hundred percent. Yeah, okay. I have a, very briefly though. I'm gonna just you know people should be you know watching Renfair. If you haven't watched it yet, please go ro- watch yeah, it. Awesome. Jamie and I were both huge fans. Uh, it, it you know it, if you're interested in unique real life su- subjects and especially all of these various vendors and actors and managers of this Texas Renaissance Festival who have their own version of a succession or a King Lear power struggle that somehow Lance was able to get access to and all of these various characters including the lead king george of it who i i when i was emailing lance about it i was like dude he's elderly david lynch uh the the, (laughs) the, straight up there but he's also cross-eyed and he's kind of like a willy wonka figure to everyone it's it's a very amazing uh thing and also in terms of just how it's shot uh we were so struck by the way that 
you know, it, it adopts, a, you know, a very elaborate and composed style of recreation, but also documentation at the same time. And very, very much, uh, I think, inspired one of the main movies we're going to be uh, talking about today. But yes, Lance, what uh, are the two films we're going to be talking about? Because I really I felt one was a pretty major inspiration than the other one. I was like, I was trying to figure it out. And I was like, I don't know if I did, but I'm curious <laughs> to hear. I was like, maybe he just wants to hurt us and uh, have us discuss horrible production history. I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, we got we got two heavy hitters. I mean, we, well, we got George Romero's Night Riders, uh, which I feel like has recently been having a kind of comeback. I remember I, I had first heard about it because I had read the Ann Thompson like IndieWire piece. I don't remember when that was published. Seemingly a while ago, but I think weirdly, that, that was when he was died. Like, I think it was when Romero died that she posted about yeah, the, right. um, that she she had been on set and um, it, it got able to experience some of uh, what was happening there, which honestly, very much like your show felt like it was like a family of people who were just like gathering and playing dress yeah. up and fantasy and having a great time. Well, yeah, I mean, the the, the um I mean, it's amazing that what, what a what a world that she was like. I don't even know how young she was when she went on set. But yeah, th- this was a movie. You know, when I was first looking around, seeing what is there Renaissance Fair cinema that exists? <laughs> what's going on? You know, what's what? what and wait, George Romero's the one who did it. <laughs> George Romero. Yeah, I was like, what in the fuck? How is that possible? So I I I was uh, I actually I have to admit I never had finished watching it until really now. I had seen bits and bobs of it. And uh, when we were shooting, I would get so tired. Sometimes I'd throw that, throw it on for the crew to watch. And I think people were just, uh, you know, it's we'll, we'll get into it. It's it's a beautiful, very beautiful, tragic, flowy kind of movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And so usually what ended up happening is I'd throw it on and I'd get outvoted by my crew and we'd have to throw on uh, the fan or the fanatic, both movies, one starring Robert De Niro, one starring John Travolta. Let's go. Uh, that would be the kind of cinema. We that have covered both those movies. Like. Yeah, the fan, the fan is an all timer. We are, we agree <laughs> with yeah, the crew. Both, both have their, uh, yeah, both both have their own merits. And the other film, uh, which I wanted to throw in, and you know, look, you guys have covered a lot of movies. Initially, I was like, maybe we could talk about Demon Lover, but you guys already did it. Yeah, and do you know what? The patrons voted for it, so it's actually their fault. They're the ones who made us do it. Come on, patrons. (laughs) No, but the uh, I I I wanted to throw on something, which again, I another film where I had seen uh, moments of it. I'd I'd seen uh, you know just the the, I mean it's an episodic movie, uh, and this is Twilight Zone the movie. I had seen uh, it's it's uh, it's a good life, which we'll talk about. That features a uh, child. It's a remake of a of, of probably one of the best Twilight Zone episodes, in my opinion. Uh, a child that is the uh, uh, not so benevolent ruler of a, a town of of adults, and anything he wants to happen happens. He has a wish, and uh, in Twilight Zone the movie, it's remade by Joe Dante. And uh, you know, yeah, that's a movie, though, of, very much amazing. enjoyed in pieces, I think, if we're going to t- compare the two on that front. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, watching it all down <laughs> yesterday, I was sort of um, I, 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 I left feeling so empty and well, we'll talk about it. I, I, I and, and depressed. <laughs> but um, but, you know, there are some highlights of it like the uh, there are we'll get into it. I mean, Joe Dante did a great job with the uh, although there's strange things going on <laughs> in his uh, remake of it's it's a good life. And then there's also a. Uh, a great George Miller uh, finale, um, mm, even though if it's thematically, narratively, very much the same thing. You could tell one of the directors, at least out of the whole bunch of that movie, uh, was able to do something unencumbered by probably the horrible production drama that you know yes. settled that entire movie's history. But anyway, so Night Riders and Twilight Zone the movie, we're going to talk about all of it. I, I appreciate we you guys. Are. Having L- me. Lance was like, "How many great directors can I fit in one episode?" Yeah, it's like I want yeah. Romero, yeah. I want Spielberg, Ten. I want Dante, I want Miller, and, and depending with, on uh, your feelings, Landis. And, well, <laughs> and luckily, with Twilight Zone, we have covered I think all four directors before, so we have a little bit of history we have. there, which is nice. We have, yeah. So I'm, it would have been excited insane if we had to go through Spielberg, Landis, Miller. Oh, oh my god, god. it would have been too Dante, much. Yeah. It would have been too much. We're going <laughs> to skip right over all the uh, director profiles. I'm going to assume <laughs> everyone knows who those guys are. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be talking about Night Riders and we're going to be talking about Twilight Zone, the movie, a very fun, uh, double feature here, but we're going to kick things off here. We're going to start it off with 
Night Riders. Uncomfortable places. <laughs> Damn uncomfortable. <laughs> Throw down the gauntlet, take up the challenge, a new age begins, romance and adventure live. Knight Riders, the legend is born. All right, we are talking Night Riders, the 1981 American. Uh, I, I always thought it was an action fantasy exploitation film, but it's yeah. really more of a drama film written and directed uh, by George Romero and starring Ed Harris in his first leading role as Billy or King William, the uh, somewhat half, maybe partially delusional, but romantic king of a medieval reenactment troupe that jousts on motorcycles and struggles to live by his Arthurian uh, I- ideals and maintain power against some external pressures like promoters uh, and some more internal ones with some, uh, you know, uh, some other would be kings. Uh, this is our, I believe, actually our sixth or seventh time talking about George Romero on oh, the show, really? obviously. Damn. Yeah, one of the, 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 the yeah, sneakily, one of the Mount Rushmore gods of, the, <laughs> yeah. of of Slezoids. I mean, obviously for the Night, Dawn, and Day of the Dead trilogy, which are still among the most politically angry and like this really upsetting and depressing, not just zombie films, but but horror films. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether he was tacking civil rights in Vietnam or he was doing consumerism or Day doing the sort of ethics versus the bloodthirsty militarism um, quality. We've, we've covered all those, uh, but we've also got episodes on some of the more low-key ones, The Crazies, which leans oh, yeah. more into like the political satire bleakness. That was pretty mm-hmm. early on. The and then uh, Martin. That one that... Uh... The, the Amusement Park the yeah, one that I guess came it was out a lost film for a little while yeah the amusement park Pretty- was, was, that, was that was one of was that his last no what was the what was the last movie he had made with the bunch i mean it's interesting that romero also did uh there was something when i had made my first film some kind of heaven people were telling me i had to watch um Fuck! Was it, it, it the amusement park? I, I think I it was because it because the amusement is, park yeah. uh, would, would it be about it was about the senior citizens as well. But yes. it was like it was yes. it was like yeah. it almost felt honestly like a Twilight Zone episode where like this mm-hmm. old guy got caught on like this assembly line of just like this is old people get thrown away at a park. And yes, it becomes, this you was know? Far, this was not his last film though. This must have been earlier in his career. But this no, is another, yeah, he, he, yeah, he shot it in the seventies, but it was it was lost and found by his family and released really recently, like in like in the. Dude, years ago 2019 2020 maybe like yeah so it was it was a good find and yeah so we we talked about that and we did martin his vampire Mm -hmm. movie as like pittsburgh drug addiction drama and i think most recently um it was a creep show uh which was a little bit of an outlier because we were like you know here's him really leaning into the ec comics like colorful exaggeration uh, and more of like stephen king's like coked out anthology writing kind of inspired him to go visually in a different direction but but lance uh what's the relationship king man you got stephen king from night riders Mm -hmm. straight into (laughs) creep show look at that's right this is actually the connection apparently uh stephen king was already courting him for creep show and so that's why he appears in this movie um but lance what briefly what's your relationship with Romero do you have like a formative do you have one that you watched for the first time and you were like who who's this guy you know it's funny I mean I, I actually really saw most um, I, I I've seen uh Dawn of the Dead and I saw I'm I don't remember when I saw D- Day of the Dead but I, I yeah, had that's seen one where Dawn they're all in the, the military Dead. bunker and it has that head being pulled off yeah where it's vocal yeah cords tear that's a <laughs> oh, moment so I've just never I forgotten. can't say <laughs> I, I can't say though like look I, I have a ton, ton of uh, appreciation for his his movies I'm not um as well versed in his films especially uh okay. like movies like Knight Riders I had no idea well, that Knight Riders had the yeah. capacity it's it yeah. seems so far out from anything that I would have imagined uh you know the kind of king of horror uh and this mm. specific kind of horror to be doing well that's I always funny. sort that, of associated that's... with him with that with kind of a uh you know sort of corman-esque person although even corman had his own uh you know there, there, there were some outlier movies that you would that, do a that, biker that movie every things. so often you know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. but 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 that was what was uh, very cool about this, even when it came out. Like, because your response was not different than like what 
people kind of responded to. This came out at a very interesting time in his career. He spent a good portion of the 1970s essentially chasing the success of Night of the Living Dead. He did Season of the Witch, he did The Crazies, and he did Martin. And these are all good movies. Um, they just didn't do very well for him, especially something like Martin, which is just, it's so depressing. Yeah. It's, it's so it's, it's set in his hometown. It has one of the bleakest endings I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and he really didn't strike gold again until returning to zombies with Dawn of the Dead, which was a huge hit commercially and critically for its size and I think that I, th- I think he was a little depressed by that that he was like trying to expand and it took him literally having to make a sequel to like find success again mm-hmm. and so Night Riders is him taking financial advantage of Dawn of the Dead it's his immediate follow up to Dawn of the Dead it's the first part of a three film deal he struck at United Film Distribution which he used that success to negotiate huge creative independence and freedom that he had wanted to pursue, but he had never uh, thought he would get, including being able to make a movie that wasn't a horror movie. And so this Night Riders was his personal independent passion project that he had been wanting to make for a long time. Apparently, it originally started out as like a little bit more of a Middle Ages or medieval fantasy film, and he kind of workshopped it a little bit into this more like post- 70s easy rider you know trying to get yeah. it into the you can you can I, pitch it to people as a biker movie or something but it's also going to have all my friends it's going to be shot in pittsburgh it's going to have ken forey from dawn of the dead john amplis from martin tom savini his gore makeup buddy uh, who is more shirtless in this movie than i think you would expect it's a little <laughs> scary uh and yeah and, and stephen stephen king and like all all of these people but yeah this was really unexpected people went wait the the, the king of zombie horror is making a movie about guys who je- ride knight armor around on motorcycles and 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 joust each other and and not only that it's actually two and a half hours long and it's kind of a hoxie and melodrama <laughs> and it's more about their personal lives and their financial struggles and their sexuality more than it is awesome bike stunt work which there is as well but it's yeah. <laughs> and it has just an absolutely devastating uh beautiful ending oh, i mean yeah. the new hollywood ending like maybe. a reminiscent of a taxi driver or something <laughs> um you know i mean it, the the ending is is uh I feel like it just completely codes the whole movie in a different light. It, it, it did. I actually went really back to some tragedy, of the earlier you know? scenes after watching it because I was like, yeah, dude, there's some sadder stuff in there than I realized when knowing kind of where it was going. But the funniest thing for me is I looked at this poster and I wanted to watch it for a long time. I love George Romero. And I went, well, that's obviously just that's a Mad Max movie meets like Excalibur. Like that was literally what I thought it was. I was I had no I never I never read the log line somehow. And so I always thought that that was it was like, oh, uh, but yeah, no, I was like, th- did not expect it to be this like really, really tender and kind of sensitive melodrama that really takes seriously the fact that some of these characters like want to escape reality inside this, you know, dress up medieval troop that they're in. And they also kind of want to live by these codes and ideals, like on a deeper level than just cosplaying, mm-hmm. um, which is like just something that you would be like, it sounds like such a goofy premise that you couldn't possibly play straight. And he plays it 100 percent straight. Like it's yeah. actually quite moving and yeah. personal. And I was I was blown away by this, honestly. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about how he never really leaves the troop. You're just constantly with them and and within their perspective, no matter which character he's focusing on. So you 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 never really get to have that real life perspective that you're really just thrown into this renaissance and and the way that they try to entertain people, their their politics, their how they socialize, all of that. So it's um it's it's really cool that he hyper focuses on that. And it's, I mean, in some ways, it almost feels more like, a, like a, there are moments that feel like a Linklater movie. I know some mm-hmm. people had, when I, when I was looking up, you know, and just reading about it some more, someone had described it as like a dazed and confused <laughs> set inside this uh, very sort of absurdist milieu. Yeah, I mean, true. there's so many things that are, and, I mean, to me, the other thing that came to mind was like a movie like Boogie Nights or something where you're, mm-hmm. you're basically watching a family um, grow and then kind of collapse unto themselves and then mm-hmm. ultimately need each other, need a way of life. I mean, all of the scenes with, um, uh, you know, with Romero's, it was, his, it was, his, he was his makeup artist, right. Who plays, uh, Merlin. Savini. Yeah. yeah. Savini. I mean, unbelievable performance and also just the, uh, 
the breadth to which, I mean, his, his character moves from someone who is so desperate to wanting to be a king of his own kingdom to essentially um, kind of discombob- being discombobulated by the pressures of the modern world. You know, all the scenes with, between him and his booking agent when they're, when they're at his, you know, the, 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 the swimming pool and he's hanging out with people who are kind of fully outside of the, the, the world that he normally occupies in. It's, it uh it's all he's like dude i actually kind of like my hermetic community we were building a little utopia for ourselves there a little dorky one but you know it was it was ours (laughs) well i think that i mean to me the thing that i had like uh seen i'd seen this scene very early on where he says uh i'm uh i'm i'm I'm, I'm fighting the dragon right yes the, the, the ed harris it's like the classic scene if there is one from the movie um and i think there's there's something to me that you know, I mean, just his performance and the treatment of the way he's you, his character's whole worldview is so inspiring to me to basically take something that is, um, I mean, obviously what seems to be very personal for, for, for Romero. I mean, just this idea of, of probably wherever he was in his life at this time, he, he achieved some success already. Right. And, yep. uh, had his troop of people who he liked making movies with, wanted to keep the things together and probably wanted to resist any form of outside, uh, I don't know, com- commercial pressures uh, that, that could taint the way of life that him and his his, his band would make movies. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, there's something that's so interesting and beautiful to me about taking what, yeah, what other people probably could consider a dorky existence or... You know, I mean, at worst, I can imagine some people just looking at whatever they're doing and saying, what the fuck is this? These are freaks. <laughs> and what Romero does is he just completely like from the very opening frame of the movie to the very end. I mean, he aligns you so much. You 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 feel like you're literally there watching these people sing songs. And I mean, there's like I mean, even just the the the, the spectacle of of every single motorcycle uh, battle. It's like he doesn't just cut these things short and mm-hmm. let you uh, kind of off the hook. No, and he just shoots go on them with the real the intensity, like almost making them live their fantasy for them. Right? That was what I found eventually so moving about it. Because yeah, it's definitely it feels semi autobiographical. It does feel like here's a guy who's you know the leading leader of a troop of artists as a community of friends who collaborate and take care of each other. And they obviously he also had you know the Ed Harris characters dealing with a commitment to his own sort of you know functionally an artistic ethos or or an integrity that he's like here are these forces coming in like these you know promoters who don't really get what we do and they're trying they're, they're not interested in like i actually do want to live like a knight and with like the the actual honor of a knight and the promoter promoters are just like oh you're a vega sideshow or there's like corrupt cops who come in and, and, and attack their camp at a certain point and also one of my favorite ones the fans who don't get it when that one kid comes up to him with the fucking dirt oh, bike magazine, he's, you know, and, 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 he's, he's like, uh, you're, yes. you're my hero. And, and Ed Harris just could not, uh, accept he's it. Like, we're not a sideshow. We're not I a mean, stunt. Yeah, this is a way of we life. are, we are knights. Like we, that's the what first time <laughs> too, which is interesting. I mean, it's, you know, the kid comes back by the end, but the, the, uh, it, it, to me, it was like such a, uh, Ed Harris's performance in that one scene with that child who's just like, I want you to sign my autograph. And he is so disgusted with the request, but then also seemingly kind of turns it on himself. He, he, he tries to remember he's speaking to a child. I mean, it's a heartbreaking Mm -hmm. moment. And it's also just an amazing, it's like this other thing that was happening to me when I was watching it this time around is I can't, I couldn't not feel like uh, there was the, the meta dimension of, you know, seeing people want to protect a way of life, but then having outsiders and onlookers and gawkers kind of come in and uh, photograph mm-hmm. them. I mean, even in that one scene with the child, he's like, I don't even know I was featured in this. And he's looking mm-hmm. at a magazine and there's pictures of him in it. And, uh, yeah, I, and, I and, and he's so upset. He's like, this is some... talking about us like we're evil, evil, can evil. And he looks at the king. He's like, that's not what this is about. Like, do you understand that? Like, I'm not just a guy on a bike. It's not just about the thrill of the show. He's like, I, we earnestly believe in these traditions and there's an authenticity and there's an integrity to that. And you're not liking it for the right reasons. You're liking it because guys on motorcycles are crashing into each other, which is so funny because obviously on, on some kind of hypocritical, hypocritical level, that 
is the ap- appeal of a show. That's why people yeah. come and pay money. And they actually look at them all honestly as sometimes as slobs who drink beer and fall over themselves and laugh at bikes crashing into each other. They have parts of the shows where they like let other bikers come in and ride around with them like the fucking Nazi guys who get into like a exploitation back road back road right. chase with them for stealing their weapons at one point and it does almost get into like this gags and stunts and people riding into rivers and 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 ditches and you know it's it's one of those things where like that's so what his show is and he seems a little bit like that's not what I intended it to be and this is how we kind of have to make money but I'm not yeah. interested in going any further than this if you want to turn us into a Vegas side show I don't care if we have overhead costs I don't care if we have cops like cynically you know ra- rating us and 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 beating us I like a like a true sort of self-destructive independent artist Ed Harris's King Billy has a just a genuine vision of his troupe as actual knights and he wants to force it as much as he can even though you know the painful realization I think of the film is that the fantasy isn't isn't sus- sustainable in the face of of some of these things and the things yeah. that he wants transcend what his actual physical form you know, can, can do. And you even see that in the discrepancies and in the, or the contradictions of the shooting. Like when you get a shot of them on the bikes and they're all in their like Knight's armor and they ride past like a McDonald's, there's something so funny about how that kind of like briefly breaks the illusion for you. But mm-hmm. you just see Ed Harris's face and he's like, I did not just ride past the McDonald's. I am like actually mm. on night on a horse, which is like one of the climactic shots of, of, of yeah. the entire movie. But, but even but like the, even, oh, in, well, even in the beginning, like there's that purity to him, right? He's waking up under the trees, under I the stars. I love the opening. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he has a purity to it. Like he's meditating naked in the water. He's he's slightly <laughs> he's, whipping. He's himself. living like a knight. Yeah, exactly. Like he's he's living. His the fair part. maiden wakes up naked in the grass alongside him. <laughs> right, exactly. He lives the part through and through. And the, he but plays the, the fantasy. Right, but the horrible yeah. irony is that he kind of needs these outsiders as well to sustain the lifestyle because unfortunately you just you have to pay for things to live in the world so and and some of the actual performers or the the troupe that um that he's friends with family with you could say um they they recognize that as well and start to encourage that a little more where they're like we should get this this media help maybe it would i mean that's that's the most interesting i think that uh, even the similarities between the texas renaissance festival that i was making the ren fair Mm -hmm. doc at um and this the pressure and it's it's like fascinating to see it's so um it's it's how combustible it is but also it's just like it's it's it feels like a a time capsule of that moment in time when uh yeah renaissance fairs were were happening there were all the rage they were coming out of this uh this sort of deadhead era there was a lot of hippies people who were kind of burnouts looking to do something else with their life looking to make art um and 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 in a way that probably they could never sustain themselves if it wasn't for this um, kind of growing burgeoning marketplace they were creating around. Um, but ultimately at what point does a, a this sort of a uh, kind of alternate all artistic way of, of living uh, become a business and how do you manage those two things? And even in uh, the Texas Renaissance festival, um, that's the question that's ultimately even animating this series I made, right? It's, it's, these are similar, mm-hmm. uh, themes, it, which is sort of, how do you protect, how do you keep the magic alive when something grows and expands, uh, exponentially? How does, how does that kind of interfere with, um, the original artistic mandates that you created yeah. to begin with? And there's so many scenes in this. I mean, you don't just see it with Ed Harris's character, but there's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, like, there's there's the dimension of his relationship with his uh, with with uh, his I'm forgetting her name forgive me um, oh uh, well, the uh, his romantic uh, Lynette. interest L- Lynette yeah played by yes. Amy Ingersoll yeah. fascinating performance too and a fascinating relationship where mm-hmm. it's it's like uh, the I mean in a way she is is constantly is sort of telling him like you you have to grow up you have to figure out ways keep this together you can't just keep living inside a very narrow view of existence you know things Mm -hmm. are changing and you're not you're not moving with times yeah Yeah. and it's interesting too just that like uh like speaking on his kind of pure mindset there's already 
a, a hypocrisy built into the fact that they're using motorcycles, like that that modern entity <laughs> mixed in with his his old school ideals, his old age ideals ideals. See, but th- th- that's one of the things I ended up loving about the film, sure. and I liked about oh, your yeah. show, Lance. Too was just that, like, there's something inherently that makes you laugh because it's mm-hmm. it's silly. Mm-hmm. It, it is objectively yeah, it's so anachronistic. Silly. It's crazy, and also in this case, at least with uh, Ed Harris's character, for someone who like birthed this bizarre uh, fusion of. <laughs> Of two things, I feel like it's sort of reflective of his desire, right? It's like he wants to live in a he wants to live in the past, literally. Mm-hmm. That's what he's doing with the you know the fair and the other stuff he's doing. Yeah, he's he, also he so won't even let them play non-period music, and no, you know, I mean, he that's won't. an amazing scene when he gets <laughs> yeah. he screams at the uh, the the people playing like disco music, uh, you know, interrupting it's like shut that off, get the trumpets going. Yeah, this is a this is a night. Meanwhile, fight. He but it's like and it's also like he's he's gas. sort of. It's a similar kind of archetype, or not archetype, but the psyche he has. I mean, at least his his reliance on maybe pain and needing pain and needing danger and um, even leading himself to his own destruction at the end. It's yeah, no, I, I, I was also like thinking the, of Lawrence this, of Arabia, you know, the, yeah. the, and, and uh, the uh, opening and ending of that movie, uh, the ending of this movie of him seemingly kind of leading himself to death intentionally. Yeah, um, well, the, the, I was surprised because no by the time I got to the end of the film, I kind of saw the arc. I the the arc made more sense to me, but I was wondering there was some there were details throughout where I was like, yeah, this character is very self destructive. He's constantly putting himself in situations where it's like the mm-hmm. king doesn't have to fight. You can sit on your throne and just play the part of king. You don't need to get up and like actually physically injure yourself in the stunt show. But he keeps getting up. He keeps wanting to do it because he is this patriarch ruler of this fake Camelot in a forest field in fucking Pittsburgh and you know the idea of like him not being able to you know assert his dominance uh, is is very upsetting to him because that is his vision of of himself and some of my favorite moments was when it takes the silly you know stunt show of guys on motorcycles and night armor literally jousting with one another but Romero does shoot it in a way where he does let them briefly like live the fantasy as if it's this really exciting thing he'll shoot it on this long lens he'll get you involved in the chaos he will uh, you know, do it in this way. Like one of the moments I, I thought about a lot was when he, uh, he keeps having these like weird dreams of this like black crow that he's been cursed by mm. or whatever. And he keeps, you know, talking to uh, the, the Merlin character uh, who, cause they have a, a magician on site who was also their on site doctor, which I thought was very funny yeah. uh, played by uh, brother blue, who was actually like a spoken word, like performance artist. And he has a very great voice. He has a lot of great sequences with uh, King Billy, but he basically has this thing where he tells him like, you know, I, I see, you know, your vision and where your soul is going and like all these things you know what you what you're feeling existentially but he's just like you know it's the soul that is the land of the magic and has destiny and and can fly and can do all of these things your body is just down for a few minutes here in the dirt with the rest of us which obviously comes back full circle with the ending but it leads to a great moment like when that guy with the black crowed armor uh, shows up at the, yeah. the the Renaissance fair and he fights him. And when the moment he sees it, he's like, this is my dad. Like briefly you get into Ed Harris's headspace and you're like, wow, this is a faded fight. Like Lancelot facing some supernatural creature or something. And he's about to have this fight. And there's that great close up when he defeats him on the ground. He does it through so much physical effort, but the blood running down his sword and going onto oh. his chest in the armor. And there's that close up oh, of yeah. the blood just streaming down and I was like, that's an epic shot. Like, that's a shot yeah. that you would include in something like John Borman's Excalibur. And to just give Ed Harris that moment of, like, if our magic, point Final of view. Fantasy. It is. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is like we we I completely identify with his dream and feel getting swept up. And that was something I think that I really latched on eventually, Lance, to about your show, where even though you're looking at something completely silly, at a certain point, the way that you shoot it, the way, you know, it's it's empathetic and it, it takes these characters' subjective fantasies seriously and it gets you kind of swept up in their perspectives. And it was something I really, really felt in in Ed Harris's performance and in how Romero shoots him here. It's, it's like an ultimate form of empathy to be like, this guy's doing something silly, but he wishes that he was a knight. So I'm going to make him feel like a knight, even yeah. if it's just for oh, totally. a minute, you know, it's amazing. I mean, there's, other, there's other, not, not to keep making a, a PTA uh, comparison comparisons but outside of the sort of like nuclear family and the the the, the destruction of it or the not nu- you know alternative to a nuclear family in boogie nights mm-hmm. there was something in the scene with the prison where he's uh, his buddy gets uh 
he basically won't pay off a cop and they uh he he his buddy gets brutalized and they get both get locked in a slammer and he returns yeah. and his uh his his members basically have a um there's a forking path that it, it starts to emerge i also was thinking about the master a little bit just just given the uh um, you know existence of those two scenes back to back when him and when uh lancaster cell, died yeah. and freddie quell go to the cell and then he comes back and it seems like the uh the 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 aims and of 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 the leader and the aims of the followers start to di- diverge mm-hmm. um and there's something amazing about the arc of 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 Tony. Uh, the, what is his last name again? The makeup artist. Oh, Savini. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Tom Tom Savini. He plays Tom Morgan, Savini. who is who, who's, who's the black knight of the film, who is like the guy who kind of disagrees with with Billy, and also is the guy who seems like more willing to sell out because I guess he was like a biker first. He's like, I do the night thing to like keep being able to do the bike show. Like that's yeah. ultimately why. I, and and he comes alive during the big performances where you get guys I, I will say doing some pretty insane stunt motorcycle Crazy show play stuff. like the weapon the, <laughs> the weapon shit, combat yeah. on chariots with maces that's functionally you know like they're doing physical damage the fucking finale features guys going off of ramps and just like People doing flips hit with motorcycles like that yeah. patron I, don't, uh, I, I literally cringed every time someone put a weapon into the spokes of the front tire and oh, a guy literally yeah. front flipped and went flying it probably it happens almost, like four or five times in the movie and I was like that guy is like legs are broken. <laughs> the amount of times you see a man get scorpioned where they just bend their back because their oh. their torso has hit the ground is ridiculous. <laughs> and they're doing it off of like just just straight dirt off these really uh, fast moving motorcycles. They're hitting uh, at a certain point when they're doing the chase sequences, they're also going over cars doing this. Um, oh the, the, some of the cr- craziest shots is when uh, Romero puts the camera actually inside the the double cycles where one guy stands and the other guy drives and then he'll have a guy d- be dragged behind the motorcycle as he has the camera right in front of him so you can just see it from like almost the driver's perspective it's it's yeah. unbelievable the way he the motorcycle stud craft is legitimately great and Romero yeah. shoots it like it is like life or death combat for these guys like in the middle ages and it's, a, it's pretty fantastic but that's where the Tom Savini character lives like that is his yeah. spot that is where he's going to defeat King Billy and become the next king but also King Billy doesn't like that because he and actually a lot of the other members don't like that including the character of Alan played by Gary uh, Latte who's I think meant to mm-hmm. be kind of like the young handsome Lancelot mm-hmm. figure who is actually loyal to King Billy and the reason they're loyal is because they think that Billy's like heart is like really in the magic of this place and of this community that he's made he has the best interest of everyone in mind and they look at a character like Morgan and they go he's pretty egotistical he's pretty dangerous and clearly his interest in all of this is to kind of sell us out although his arc over the course of the movie as kind of lance was pointing out is to actually come around to appreciating the magic of what billy has created because when he does eventually sell out and kind of go with the promoter and try to start his own kingdom he realizes that it's just taking these really lame photographs of him in like a speedo with women under the Night Riders I mean, thing, which is an incredible shot. The whole sequence is uh, is amazing. Yeah. It's like one of my favorite moments of the entire uh, film is just the... He looks uh, so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great performance and just the ex- just kind of the popping of the bubble and it leaving the... Uh, I mean, you, I feel like that, that sequence must come about like two hours into the movie once you've really settled into a rhythm of being with the troop and i mean every time you're with the troop it's not again it's like the dialogue scenes uh, when 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 the jousting is happening these aren't like 5 minute montages right these are like 40 minute fucking scenes it at least yeah, it feels that way so long, uh, actually, yeah. they are so long actually they're so long that it, it it that the movie is it seems like doing something where I, I don't know if he was intentionally trying to give people the evil Knievel stunts that they probably he wanted to go and see it right and but then uh you know try and, and give them a real melancholic kind of uh ultimately pretty um well, I guess it's interesting. I wouldn't call it like a, a nihilistic movie by any means. I, I, I mean, even after a uh, spoiler, uh, Ed Harris passes away and he, get, he dies at the end of the movie. Um, it seems like the family that he helped, you know, form, they all unite around his passing. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is something that feels so. Um, yeah, it's like the, the sadness of it is is his it's like the the only way that. 
at least the, the life that he was trying to lead and maybe um, his very narrow view of, of what, of how like art and commerce and these different things could coexist. I mean, given, you know, the, the troop continues without him by the end. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's almost like once, once, once he no longer is necessary or needed to, to lead anymore, he, he, everyone um, actually does kind of want to live by his standard a little bit more after that. Right. Like they saw this display that he went and, and, and near the end of the yeah, film too, he it. does also compromise a little bit with them or he tries to yeah. welcome them. He realizes he's kind of taking some of his troop, uh, for, for granted in some scenes. I mean, I think, I think that Ed Harris really nails the performance on, I think a, a couple different scenes where, where he does that. There's one extended one where he just goes up to like this guy who's writing like a folk song as part of the troop. Mm. And at that point, most oh, yeah, of the, amazing. like the really close troop has left him. Like Tom Savini has went with the cynical promoter and Alan got really upset because he was trying to like physically protect him in a fight. And he said, you should not be fighting. And literally Ed Harris fights the shit out of him and almost injures him to be like, Alan, step the fuck off. Like, I don't, you know, so he leaves for a little while uh, with a, with a girl to go and try and live out, you know, being outside of the uh, show uh, and see what life is like out there. And then again, he doesn't like reality. So everyone briefly like tries to go back to reality for a bit. And everyone's like, it's not the magic of being with my friends and doing what we were doing. And they all come back. But before that, Ed Harris is just like being like, Am I, you know, I must be taking these guys for granted, you know, like other people have wants and needs. They're, they're not just uh, mine, even though, you know, he has guys like that, that guy that you were mentioning, Lance, who gets the shit beat out of him in the police station. There's that scene when they're all around the campfire, because there is almost like a hangout quality to some of this where they are just like, they're playing songs around a campfire or they're getting food ready. And yeah. one of the campfire ones in, in this is where they do have a promoter who's just like, look, you know, money makes the world go round, even your little one and it's you know he's completely resisting you know even though the troop is like near collapse and he's just like it i don't care if the troop dies because we would be believing in it we would be maintaining some sort of code my ideals wouldn't be corrupted or at least i wouldn't feel they would be and the one guy tells him straight up He's like, the last time I was in a cell for being beaten up, I tried to kill myself because I was alone. And yeah. last night I got my ass kicked by that like corrupt fucking Pittsburgh cop or whatever. And do you know what? I was laughing and I was having a great time and I'm with you. And that's because I have Camelot. He's like, mm -hmm. if you let this thing die because it doesn't adhere to your specific code and your vision, like think about what you're doing to the rest of us, you know? Yeah. And, and it's something that really does get in his head that he starts to feel the pressure of at a certain point is that, you know, you do have a responsibility to the people who are part of your thing, even if you are an independent artist and it is ultimately your vision, you do owe something to your collaborators and to your community that you formed around it. And yeah, I think Romero absolutely uh, feels that experience in Ed Harris. Like, I really think that how much Romero clearly identifies with the Ed Harris character is the magic of this movie. Like, you do go and you're just like, yeah. man, I feel the the pain and the torture, and Ed Harris nails the performance. When I turned this movie on, I will say, I did not expect to be, like, like tears in my eyes, like, oh, my God. Like, you yeah. know, like, Ed, 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 the, Ed Harris is straight up just, he's, he's making me feel things. Yeah, the, uh, the one of the the saddest details but also a, a, just a, one of the biggest signs of respect that it shows for um, Billy when he does pass away and they have that very sad very like foggy downbeat uh, funeral scene is um, the, the singer that he talks to before he's kind of working on a song and that's why he approaches him and he tells him he's like I'll once I finish it I'll show it to you and it's the song that he's singing to him at the funeral when they're burying oh. him so it's just like he finishes it for him out of a sign of respect because even though, you know, he may have put him in a kind of compromised position at a certain point just on a, you know, how they with how they live, um, he still respected his king and, uh, you know, respected his ideals in the way that he uh, treated everybody at the end of the day. So yeah, and the fact that he'll make room for a little character like yeah. that, the same way like yeah. like Little John, played by Ken Forey, who's like the blacksmith, or Rocky, who's like the badass female knight, played by Cynthia Adler. Uh, Romero's wife, Christy Forrest, shows up as Angie, who's like the grease monkey mechanic mm -hmm. who fixes the bikes and, and mm -hmm. all that. And, you know, he really does carve out space for everyone to kind of have a moment, to have a bit of personality. I mean, like Pippin, the guy played by Warner Shook, who's the guy who, you know, and ha is outed the fact that he's queer. And, you mm -hmm. know, he ends up actually finding love inside the troupe with a man named Punch. And, you know, uh, th there's no person who's, I think, ever been had more plain joy on screen than that drunk goo 
goofball monk who is consistently <laughs> uh, just having greasy, greasy pizza sex yeah. uh, for like half, yeah, like that was in, insane, disgusting, yeah, but scene. beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they found love. <laughs> it was like Abel Ferreira eating that pizza slice and the driller killer all over again. I was like, oh no. Uh, but that guy was loving it. And do you know what? For a brief moment, I was like, good for him. Yeah. And I love the little fun interactions that they have too. And it's more lighthearted. Like when the cops first arrive, that guy, he, he arrives drunk to warn Alan, who I think at the time is is having sex in the bushes. They're going to find my still. And he's like, dude, having wine is not like against the law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's more fun to pretend it is. <laughs> yeah. So there is this kind of, even like that has this outsider perspective where he's like, yeah, but this, even this lifestyle is probably more fun in some way. Um, it's more exciting. At least there's thrills behind it. Um, and also that, that cop at the, in the scene where he decides to double down on getting a bribery, it's crazy how quickly he jumps from, uh, you know, saying I don't have a warrant to just using the gun in order to do so. Yeah, they're like, like the, we have a permit, like from the sheriff. You can't, you can't be here. Like, look at we, we may have jesters and trumpeteers and fucking wine barrels, and it might seem like we're just fucking partying out here, but this is a this is work. A legal establishment. <laughs> our games are fucking like you know we pay our taxes. You know? yeah. <laughs> they're just yeah. like you know, and and well, this Americans. cop is like no, very straight out of a Burt Reynolds movie or something. He's like no. No, 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 fuck you guys. You guys are moonshiners. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And the way that the cop comes back actually near the end, I think, is uh, fantastic. It's a great, great mm-hmm. moment. I mean, that's another moment of like a, 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 a gratuitously long but uh, extremely fun and hilarious scene. Oh, it's so important. Where the cop just too, gets though, like, to, to, again, to feel it's great. To, to get swept up with him because, like, there's, the, the, there's this whole arc where. You know, Billy is very much regretting the fact that so many of his troop are feeling, you know, disrespected and like that he's going to he's he's killing uh, the you know, this magic place that they love because he's not willing to compromise his vision or his ideals for it. And eventually they do you know, kind of all, all make their, their way back, especially Morgan and Alan. Cause both of them try briefly, you know, Alan tries to go and hang out with this girl named, uh, Julie, who is clearly actually using him as an escape from her abusive family, mm-hmm. which is an interesting something. They even give time to a character like her. It's crazy how that, everyone, yeah. you know, gets, gets this stuff. And, you know, and, and Alan, comes back and Morgan goes back and they eventually do go like, look, we're going to put on, you know, the final 30 minutes is basically like back to their show. They're going to do one big final fog drenched fight. And it is going to be this, you know, this entire thing where, you know, we are, he is going to surrender his kingdom to someone and he is going to let them decide the future because clearly, you know, he needs something else and they need this place and he can't, you know, he's going to keep ruining it in, in, in some capacity. And I love that it's cut with like that beautiful sequence of Alan and Morgan and all the knights riding back on the highway, like all the way back to him, long sequence of them going back. And then they're like, he's agreed to fight. It's going to be a fair fight. And whoever wins is going to get named King. And it's this huge extended fucking fight sequence is, is ridiculous there are, for most of the stunts it kind of does get a little repetitive like they do they have a certain mm-hmm. amount that they do the jousting sticks and and the bikes and they're hitting it's the ramps there a, is one they do in the finale though where that guy on the bike literally runs into a ramp and i'm almost certain oh, dismembered man. his leg doing that <laughs> yeah it's wild there's a there's also another one where a guy kind of does that scorpion move again but over the hood of a car and when he lands it looks like he breaks his ankle full out it, oh it's, god it's oh ridiculous. yeah and i forgot to yeah, the mid air chariot swipe that happens in in one of the moments too either way there's there's a a whole bunch of fantastic stunts and everything like that there is something to be said about the repetition and how long these things go for it seems like now i think i think romero is indulging a little bit but that it is fun but i i do think it 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 kind of accents just how physical this is, how much they put their bodies through over and over again, every single day. Oh yeah. And and that, that, that's a key. That's a key to all of this because like for, for Billy, this is like, again, my, he has this bodily existence. He has this existence on the ground and it's not what he wants. It's not good enough. He wishes, he wishes he was a knight. And he, at a certain point, he, I think he just relinquishes that. He goes, I'm not going to achieve that. I can maybe find it spiritually, which is what he tries to do at the end of the movie. So Mm -hmm. that's why he puts on, 
on the show where he's like, everyone else, I'm going to give them a chance. They're going to have, they're better off with this place than I am. And everyone actually does briefly wonder because it is Tom Savini's Morgan who wins. And obviously you've been kind of trained to, you know, find him again, egotistical and kind of against the, the ethos of the entire thing. But the arc of his character of kind of coming back and being like, you know what, you deserve to be king, man. And you, you will actually probably, you know, take this in, in the right direction. You've now seen what the cynical promotion side looks like and you don't like it. You're going to come back and you're going to rule how this place should be ruled. And everyone just smiling and crying while he's surrendering it. And Lynette giving her crown to fucking Angie. Cause you know, she's, she's partners with the, the Morgan character. And he's like, I'm going to go try and live by my code solo is basically mm. the finale of this movie. And yeah, it is, fucking incredible the way he does it because he leaves with obviously the black crow fighter um who uh is is the sort of like silent indigenous guy who is 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 riding along um with him and they first stop at the uh like i think it's like a mcdonald's or just some sort of fast food joint at midnight where he goes and he hunts down that cop because when that cop oh, beat yeah. the shit out of his friend earlier in the movie he was so pissed off because the sheriff un- lets him out and says they had a permit, dude. Why are they even here? And he says, I'm fucking coming for you. Look over your shoulder. One day I'll be there. And he shows up at that fucking fast food joint and he just starts beating the shit out of this cop. And it's so funny. You would think everyone would like react in like a <laughs> horror or, but instead People everyone is like, what a show they're cheering him on. They're giving him a standing ovation for beating the shit out of this cop in a McDonald's. And I've edited, Harris is so fucking happy and the fact that everyone dude, he's a real warrior and everyone thinks he's a righteous guy and, <laughs> and, and the, one of the best parts is that he gets a classic 80s fist pump right before he leaves the oh, restaurant yeah. and everything I'm just like I was standing up and applauding it was a fantastic moment um, what a moment to, to give him <laughs> and on, I also on, love on Romero's part uh, Romero like we were speaking on how kind of long and, and um, repetitive sometimes the 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 stunt work can be in the in the motorcycle jousting, but there's also the long shots of driving as well. But it, it again, it just it accents the freedom of it all, and um, and then it really works well when we get to this part with with Ed Harris and his kind of uh, his final moments. Um, oh my god! The, the way that he goes to the kid's school dressed in his bloody armor, having just beaten up the shit out of a cop, and he just passes his sword down to his like confused kid in the entire classroom of confused people, being like, "What just happened?" And he silently just like nods. He's like, yeah. "Here's my sword, son. I'm you know I'm 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 moving on." And while riding his bike on the highway, I guess he's like bleeding out from so many of the injuries that he's accrued right. through all of the fights in the film because he's just been taking on too many uh, fights, and it's through bleeding out. That he has that hallucinatory vision that that ends the film where he sees himself actually riding a horse like a real knight and the, the music is just fucking going off and then it cuts out it goes back into reality and you know this pure fantasy vision mode uh that smiling that ed harris was just doing as he gets fucking annihilated by a truck head first yeah. like <laughs> low angle shot of his armor just exploding all over the road it, it is a bummer ending straight out of like like a new hollywood kind of kind of ending like i did think about the ending of easy rider while uh yeah. watching it or, but um, the fact that romero follows it up with that sweet funeral scene that lance was i think pointing out is like i think one of the key uh part parts of it because it really does feel like you know the the entire troop is you know thinking about their fallen king and thinking about the fact that he did kind of pass on this vision and yeah you know they they might try to adhere to it they might try to live by it like here is a guy who sacrificed his life for his vision and yeah. we're gonna respect that we're gonna honor that and there's yeah there's something kind of beautiful about that isn't there another movie that ends that way too it's called um it's a it's a driving movie as well it's a vanishing point is that what it is we're gonna we're gonna spoil mm. every yeah sorry uh, 70s road movie for you they, like sure end end way. They, they liked to end this way they they like being like here's <laughs> <laughs> feel a lot of things for this guy and then just watch him get annihilated by a car right at the end yep yep doing what he loves um <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 fantastic. I also love there. There's a line in uh, the the song that that guy's singing at his funeral that just goes so well with that ending, where he says, uh, "I'd rather die in the hurricane than never know the storm," and that is definitely yeah. encompassing. Uh, I Billy's would let those castles mindset. tumble than to never love at all. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a nice little song. It's a good tune. Yeah, I liked it. That, of course, in that context, it almost feels a little bit more. I don't know. 
it's a little cheerier or hopeful when he says it before when they're having the meeting and then at the funeral you're like oh my god and there's these kind of rituals that some of the characters are doing like one of the guys um takes some of the dirt from the grave and rubs it on his face and then you see some of them not being able to really be around the body like they're uh, much farther down the field kind of doing their own mourning um it's it's i mean just full of detail it's it's great stuff I was really, really surprised by this one. And if we're, I think, pivoting towards the reductive rating round here, uh, Lance, which we remove all the words and all the nuances, give the movie a rating between one and five. But it's also kind of turned into final statements uh, and any like scenes or any lines maybe we didn't touch upon while we were uh, breezing by. This was a two and a half hour film, so it was hard to get into yeah, it's, it's, too it's, it's, much it's, crazy, <laughs> crazy hangout detail because there, there's a lot of it. There's so many. I'm, there's, I'm sure there's yeah. even side characters who have histories we even forgot to mention because there's just no, I mean, there's it's, so it's, much it's like a, its own episodic. I mean, there's there's a there's a sentience that the movie has or some sort of like omniscience that's kind of it's so dense that it's almost hard to even Mm -hmm. wrap your head around which is shocking because you're like wait you you guys you guys are talking about the one where they dress up in knight's armor and like ride motorcycles and joust each other like you just would not i really was did not expect that out of this movie no it sticks with you and it's 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 haunting man really and it's Mm great i mean the fact that it's ed harris is it's his first performance right i mean it's like Uh, it's it's first leading for sure yeah i think it's his first leading i think it's his third feature uh, film I see. Something I like think that. he's just a fucking absolute amazing actor who does not get the hmm. props that he deserves. One I mean, of the know, great you know, faces and voices for sure. There are things that he does in this that are just amazing. And just, I mean, again, the, the, uh, it, it's, it's like the sensitivity of an artist, but the, but the, um, Obviously, I could you could see there's a dimension that he's like uh, channeling his inner James Dean when he's on a fucking motorcycle yeah. and he's moving around. Yep. I mean, he's he's luxuriating in it. I remember there's the scene where he's with his uh, what, it's like his lawyer. Is that who he is? Is the guy they're they're sleeping and he uh, he, he's this is after he he, got, he gets his other buddy out of prison and his his friend is telling him there's like two ways that things are going to go down and it's news that pisses him off. And he decides to steal his buddy's bike for the night and he takes it out for a spin. And it's just this. uh, And I think that's the first time maybe that you see a civilization that's like around like city civilization that you're he's 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 moving past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just I don't know. To me, there was just something so haunting about the whole thing. I get, you know. It's not it's 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 not for everybody in the sense that if if you uh, if you enjoy a straight linear <laughs> tightly wound narrative that has a revved up story engine i feel like um look this is a movie that's much you gotta more, luxuriate i think in this yeah one. you gotta let it wash over you i mean honestly it's probably best to see this thing if if, if it ever can be played in a theater i mean come mm-hmm. on I'd love i found that. i found myself uh, uh just like I, I committed to the process uh when i when i was rewatching on an airplane but i i will say it was I was also distracted sometimes just by the people that kept looking over their shoulder to see what I was watching <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, seeing me probably get somewhat uh, moved by it. If they could study the micro expressions of my face yeah. probably was just as puzzling of an experience of seeing the movie here. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's great, man. I think it's really um, it's a bummer that it didn't have more of a cultural foothold when it came out. I, I wish... Uh, there was more I think movies it's time. that Romero made. I, everyone yeah, is like ready that. for for Night Riders because yeah, this was a, a fairly easy. This is a fairly easy four for me, if not like honestly a strong four. Because again, yeah. I, I, part of it I think was the shock because again I went into this I was like oh Mad Max Excalibur I see what he's doing you know it's just going to be guys. I actually thought it was going to be a post-apocalyptic movie where guys just (laughs) thought they were knights and they were crazy. Like that's legitimately. And then when I was like, Oh wait, this is like a community hangout melodrama about people who just like run a gearhead Renaissance fair. I should have clued in. Um, and uh, just the fact that all of the scenes of them hitting ramps and swinging maces and knights armor is just interspersed with this, these very tender digressions into the complexity of their personal lives and you know, their, their dreams and all of these things. Again, it's, it, it, 
if it seems like it should be so goofy and i think romero's personal connection to it in just an autobiographical way as a as a, as a troop of artists and as a commitment you know committing to your artistic ethos and you know realizing that there's all these financial pressures that are maybe asking you to sell out and you know the realization that maybe it's not enough and also it's not just for you you know that this fan you know that, that you, you have to share it a little bit and and ed harris is so good at getting that tortured quality the tragedy of this king billy character who is at once you know like the ultimate performer but also this like independent artist who has to learn to manage money and like manage the logistics of his place and just the idea of like romero's heart just so bleeding for this guy whose vision is so beyond like it transcends what is possible in his physical reality and so romero there's so much i thought just so much empathy to depicting it in the uh, you know in in a way where you totally indulge his fantasy for him whether it's in the motorbike action sequences or whether it's in like the the way that he shoots the entire final stretch for him where he's beating up a cop and everyone is cheering for him he's passing his sword down to his kid and he gets to hallucinate himself on a horse and romero is giving him these moments of just like soulful catharsis of being like here you go you are a knight and even though the reality everything about reality is telling him that he can't do that and he gets fucking annihilated by a truck for it and despite that <laughs> ending i was just so deeply moved by this entire thing it's such a strange singular work you would not expect the guy who's famous for the fucking dawn, dawn of the dead to be the guy who who made this movie and i think that adds to the beauty of it the fact that all of his friends are in it his wife is in it all of his closest collaborators are playing central roles yeah. and having this arc and a lot of trust the there. fact that it, yeah it, it, there there is and it's just you know you're playing the, the fact that playing tacky medieval dress up and doing dangerous motorcycle stunts in a field is you know, brings so much feeling, I think, in in this film and all in the name of just making a few like local working class spectators day, like just slightly more fun. I don't know. There was something that, you know, actually had me tearing up by by the end of um, um, watching this. So I, if anyone's not seen it, I, I can't uh, recommend it enough. I, I think what hurt this, it came out the same day as Borman's Excalibur, which is really funny. Oh, wow. I, I read that and I was like, hold on. So I was That's like, every, everyone had the key. What a double feature that whatever yeah. guy decided to do both had that day uh that he amazing. could go get king arthur uh style but yeah if you haven't seen this oh my god please uh check it out especially if you like ed harris too because i've loved ed harris yes. man like He's i've one of his best. seen so yeah i've seen so many fantastic movies with him um and yeah this was one that i was i actually did not even know he was the lead of and he tore my heart out of my chest so i was like god damn yeah yeah he's great yeah i'd also give it a strong four i was shocked at how much this moved me <laughs> uh especially just looking at the poster for so many years going i'm gonna watch that eventually i just i had no idea uh how much nuance there were gonna be with the characterization yeah ed harris is fantastic so it's uh, Savini, by the way, who um, was doing a lot of his own stunts because he has background in uh, motorcycles and um, stunt work on motorcycles. So I was watching this interview Damn. where apparently he said, uh, like, you know, he was swinging the mace around and they used a lot of his shots doing it because he was just swinging it much harder than the other stuntmen <laughs> were. Like his real yeah, character, oh he was a bit of a dangerous asshole. Oh, or, yeah, he was a and bit and wild. also the fact that he's playing such a character that's meant to be very hunky um is was very funny to me kind of as the movie went along he was very upsettingly jacked is how i'm going to describe him like when i when i saw underneath <laughs> his armor and i was like dude this guy is so fit yeah, he so could have been an action star yeah, i was real. actually but his face doesn't look like that so i was <laughs> a little, it, it kind of upset me a little bit to see that i don't know why i just my body <laughs> rejected it a little bit yeah That's funny. Um, but in a cool way that works for the character <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and i did i did watch this it was just like a minute segment of some interview with romero and apparently the the motorcycles was um, one of the producer's ideas and he was kind of like taken aback by it and didn't like it. But then he started thinking about how he could mix that, you know, the old school mentality with the modern entity. And it really does end up working well with Ed Harris's character, the way that that arc uh, ends up going. So um, I thought that that was kind of interesting. And uh, but yeah, it just it seems like Romero has a real respect for the the purity of the mindset of, of, of Billy, but he also realizes you have to take care of your people. You got to take care of your troop. And, um, and I, I just think that he, this is a film where it's just the director wearing his heart on his sleeve the entire time. Uh, it's at certain points, it's almost 
I would say you could say it's overly sentimental, but you you just buy into it. It's not one of those things that comes off as um, like cheesy or undeserved. It really those uh, Dave Care in his contemporary review described it as a movie that falls into that territory where it's uh, uncomfortably personal yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a way totally I, I i don't disagree but in a kind of a positive way oh yeah i mean it positively <laughs> for sure um but yeah yeah so strong four i would highly recommend it everyone go check it out all right well i think that's going to wrap it up for night riders here we are going to be right back and we are going to be talking about twilight zone the movie stick around on june 24th four of acclaimed directors george miller John Landis, Joe Dante, and Steven Spielberg take you to another dimension. We are back and we are talking Twilight Zone, the movie, the 1983 anthology science fiction horror film directed by Steven Spielberg, George Miller, Joe Dante and John Landis, obviously based on and in the case of many of the segments, literal remakes and adaptations of the late uh, 50s, early 60s television show, The Twilight Zone, created by Rod uh, Serling, Uh, The Twilight Zone. Uh, we haven't talked about it a whole lot on this show, actually. Incredibly yeah. popular anthology show that ran for five seasons and was known for all of its genre bending unpredictability. That was, you know, sci fi horror fantasy, f- pulling many of its bare bones sort of premises from short stories that were published in like sci fi magazines and uh, frequently this very surreal and, and creepy tone to it and willingness obviously to deliver a pretty grim ending and some sort of social or moral commentary. I think kale originally called the show, uh, an endearingly corny and economical mixture of like supernaturalism and civics. Um, <laughs> and so like that was part of the appeal. The other appeal was the pretty amazing crop of just creators, like classic actors. Like you can't even name, like to name them all. It would mm-hmm. be take too long as like, like Lee Marvin, William Shatner, Burgess Meredith are among the ones who did multiple, but like, Burt Reynolds, an episode, Dennis Hopper, Donald Pleasance, James Coburn, like way too many. And then the directors the show gave opportunities to included many directors we've covered on the show. Yeah. Richard Donner, Don Siegel, Stuart Rosenberg, Jacques Turner, Ida Lupino, and as, as well as writers like Charles Beaumont, who was a regular um, Corman collaborator. And of course, Richard Matheson, who was one of the key writers alongside Serling, who's the author of I Am Legend, also wrote one of our favorite old school sci-fi movies ever, The Incredible Shrinking Man. Love it. Uh, and wrote that truck thriller uh, for Spielberg that is fantastic as well duel oh yeah and he he did that alongside wrong rod serling who we actually talked about recently because he wrote the original planet of the apes and is who gave it that ironically uh and iconically depressing and nihilistic <laughs> sort of twist ending that it that it has that almost feels like it could have been in a, a, a twilight zone episode and, and sets and, the tone uh, for the rest it, of them <laughs> Yes. And if that wasn't enough, the show also had regular music by Bernard Herman and Jerry Goldsmith. So it was just like it was like what a what a an absolutely in, in insane show. Now, I'm assuming, Lance, that you're familiar with the Twilight Zone or your Twilight Zone head. Do you have a favorite a or formative Zone. episode? Motherfucking head, man. That's my favorite <laughs> shit. Let's go. That was like my uh, my my mom growing up. I'm You know, I grew up in Florida, but every time I my parents were from New York, every time I would go visit. Uh, other family that was in New York. My mom would take me to the museum of uh, TV and radio where I would, uh, yeah. where I would watch uh, Twilight Zone episodes. I mean, it, favorite ones, I would say um, the eye of the beholder. That's the, uh, oh, the one with yeah. The yeah. Mon, out, Easy. Out of the yeah. Park. I that, love well, the that, that, that's that's a favorite because of how they they shoot that one that because that's the one where the the woman is supposed to be ugly and she has the bandages yes. on right and then they they the whole episode is her underneath bandages and then near the end they pull her bandages off and she's like this this beautiful woman it's donna douglas and then all the uh doctors and nurses who have been very carefully framed to not ever show you their faces whether through shadows or whether <laughs> through the composition it shows that they're all like these fucking like deformed mutants essentially and like that's the twist of it is that they're trying to make her not ugly but like it's all of these mutant doctors being like oh look at this horribly <laughs> yes. looking woman that's a great episode <laughs> i have a i mean that's funny yeah, with, the, the, um, the, the, have you seen ahead. a nice place to visit that's another one that i love so much the uh the one where uh kind of a i don't know crook, if i remember that one rook on the lamb um goes uh to a casino and he's consistently he's gambling he's gambling he's making tons of money um 
he thinks he is dead and he thinks he's in heaven, which is where um, one of the car dealers asks him where he is. And um, by the end of the episode, it's like years have passed and he's still stuck inside this casino. And um, uh, he asks, um, I think he asked the person, like, can you, can you, you know, I don't want to be here anymore. Can you send me to, can you send me to hell? I'm, I'm done with being here. And um, I think the person says to him, you're already in hell. This isn't heaven. <laughs> this is this is it. And so I, I, it's like the the paradise becomes the hell. I don't know. For some reason, that one always really stuck with me too. But the, yeah, the one no, that's, there, that's dramatized in this movie, uh, it's a good life. Um, I don't yeah, know that's, that's a fantastic called. one. It, it, no, there's there's movie, so yeah. there's so many. Like I remember when I was growing up, to serve man was the one that oh, uh, my, my, my 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 parents like, which is like the the day the earth stood still style one about the nine foot tall alien contact and the alien they're like befriending the men, them and on the menu. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're they're turning they're they're turning Earth into like this peaceful utopia, and then it's revealed at the end that the aliens are actually cannibals, and that their cookbook that they've been saying, or their book they've been saying, is you know like a book to live by, is actually a cookbook, and it's not to serve man like philosophically or politically serve like they've been saying. It's literally to serve them like a pot roast. <laughs> this is incredible because it's. I mean, this ha- this pops up at least a few times a year on the show, but I was I, I got became familiar with Twilight Zone because of uh, the. The Simpsons again because they have parodied oh Twilight they, Zone they did that so one right times with Treehouse of Horror yeah they did that one the one that you were just speaking of with the aliens they also did two of these they did the uh, um, uh, segment three and four that we're going to be talking about today uh, it's a good life and nightmare oh, at twenty thousand yeah. feet so it was it was kind of cool too because I haven't seen this movie and I hadn't really seen many of the episodes, but it was, Oh, you got to go back. It's always hilarious that I see these things on the Simpsons before I see the actual original. It's such an easy show to just throw on because it's like, it's, it's 25 minutes, including credits. So it's like 22 minute episodes and every single one is just like, what could have been a 90 minute feature yeah. cut down to like the most tense and, and, and best parts. And every single one is like, dude, what if this guy was in a nuclear apocalypse, but he loved reading books. And then all of a sudden he's like, look at all this free time. I have to read books, but then his glasses break <laughs> and he becomes suicidal and he can't read anymore. <laughs> there was one I remember as a kid that I don't remember the name of that had or young Robert Redford. And it was this like wounded cop who's like knocking on doors and begging people to let them in. He comes to this old woman and she won't let him in. Cause she's scared that he's a stranger doesn't really understand and uh, when she eventually relents and lets the cute Robert Redford inside it turns out it was death knocking at her door (laughs) and that's who (laughs) she was letting in and that was the ploy either way there's a great great show tons of iconic episodes and it makes sense that so many of our best living uh, directors and John Landis uh, loved it and were obsessed with it and excited to honor it in a a, a cinematic form and uh, I'm sure most people are probably broadly familiar with this movie for one really horrible uh, reason. Um, And we're obviously it, God, it's got to be addressed. The John Landis section is obviously notorious. It is called Time Out. He actually also, I think, did the prologue as well, the yes. sort of meta section with Albert Brooks and Dan Aykroyd on, on the road trip, which is, if you like uh, Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks and just want to listen to them sing TV show theme songs, to- which is a riff that goes bizarre. on a little long, but... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. I mean, it, I mean, it's a really good uh, uh, bit, in, in, yeah. in, uh, but not a good uh, uh, Twilight Zone, the yeah. movie opener and i love albert no brooks it doesn't so it, it doesn't really make sense although make i do like albert sense. brooks them them trading favorite twilight zone like episodes or whatever and albert brooks just goes no that's an outer limits he's like no that's a zone no, well there's something that know. feels so strange about both john landis segments that actually um i mean not only is it yeah i, I went and watched the end and credits because i was like how are they going to acknowledge this that something happened and uh, mm. nothing. Yeah, they <laughs> don't, a, that, which that, is that's horrifying. the way to do it. Which is like, I mean, I guess there's no good way to acknowledge it. And I was thinking about other movies, like you know, look, The Crow obviously had an onset right. incident, but that was a complete freak accident. It wasn't the result of negligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, probably was, but not in the um, I, at least the, the legacy. I feel like of that movie was that a. Uh, uh, unless I'm totally mistaken here, right? Was that uh, I feel like people can still admire and appreciate mm-hmm. the work. Uh, that Brandon yeah. Lee did and that uh, Alex oh, Proyas, sure. right, who directed that? Did he direct that movie? Yeah. I think, yeah, he did. Um, yeah. A very different situation than, than John Landis uh, and his assistant director and everything that happened there. 
uh, basically. Yeah, well, no, because the response and, well, to it that was so awful. He was yeah, very well, apathetic, well, and, and, unfortunately. And obviously, all the information that that came out about it after the fact, but also yeah. the fact that they they left the segment in, which I think was I, th- I maybe if I'm being generous, they felt that it was like honoring Vic Morrow to throw his last performance and actually. Yeah, but it's it's for, putting for, for it's putting dirt on the guy's name at the very end of his segment. He gets t- a wheeled off to a concentration camp, but yeah, the, the thing it, that's it, weird it, it, about it, it, both it's so that, weird to keep this yeah. in and to keep the unfinished scene that they were obviously shooting at the time because if there happens to be someone unfamiliar it was it's also just a horrible it's a horrible premise i mean honestly the whole thing to me um when it first started playing i i I did not realize this was going to be the in the one the infamous uh, twilight zone the movie segment and i could not believe at first i thought it was hilarious just because of how poorly uh, done it was just the uh and I, I couldn't the the uh, it almost felt like something uh, adjacent to like uh, you know Sam Hyde comedy or or something <laughs> or, or like a Conor a Conor O'Malley sketch uh, you know maybe a more hardcore one you know or, or honestly maybe neither of those things are right maybe it's more like Dar Man uh, you know like racist <laughs> guy gets served the taste of his own medicine. And uh, yeah, it, it's such a thin concept five. that doesn't work unless you develop it creatively. And it's just, I guess, it's something that John Landis is, you know, not maybe the most known for uh, doing. And I guess right. it's loosely based on a matchup become, of a couple I, I just, different. I can't episodes. believe it's like the, the what, uh, what an amazing thing would have happened. I mean, like coming off of American Werewolf in London, if the guy uh, there was a metamorphosis of rather than him uh, just uh, symbolically being chased by people that, uh, you know, because the whole premise of this is a, a, a big, a racist man um, uh, who hates Jews, black people, and Asian people uh, becomes an Asian man, a black man, <laughs> and a Jew, and is hunted by the uh, white supremacist Nazis uh, and the American soldiers in Vietnam. And, uh, but what, yeah, I mean, cosmic I really, punishment for his racism, he travels through these historical eras and these kind of like, you know, he opens a door and then fluidly he's in another one and he's like, Oh my God, I immediately regret. It's like that. He's oh. like, I hate Jews. <laughs> Why do you think I'm a Jew? It's, it's, uh, it's this, it's, it's I mean, it's like seeding, seeding and reaping moment. <laughs> it's unintentionally kind <laughs> sowing of, uh, and reaping. Ki- kind of right. funny in a, in a way until yeah. you realize that this poor guy, Vic Morrow, the, classic movie actor died making this horrible piece of shit. I mean, I cannot yeah. believe it. I and I guess the thing no, that is interesting is John Landis, I, I think he's a great filmmaker. I mean, he had many movies that he mm-hmm. made that I think are excellent. Um, but I, I feel like the thing that would have been, I mean, look, I, you know, uh, I was just thinking about it when I was walking around today. I was just like, why didn't he just do that? Could have been more interesting. Maybe if the guy uh, met him, you know, metamorphosized into the things he hated rather than just like, uh, you know, like what if he actually became a Jewish man and there was a body horror dimension to that, or like, uh, you know, there was some sort of schizoid split that he'd have to feel rather than just external forces pursuing him. But regardless, I I think it's such a flawed concept already that feels so uh, overtly moralizing that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to really take it seriously whatsoever and it's no, not and executed it, it's also, particularly it, well. That's what I was going to say too. It's not even that like well paced or that uh, that tense or anything. It's very bluntly handled with very little creativity. And there's, I was sitting there waiting the whole time, being like, there has to be an image as good or as shocking as like that dream sequence of the mutant Nazi werewolves with Uzis in American yeah. Werewolf in London. Like that scene always blows me away every time I watch it because it just feels like it comes out of nowhere and it's clearly that guy's anxiety kind of come to life where he's you know actually watching his mom and dad just killed by these like Nazi werewolves and like slitting their throats like it's it's really pedal to the metal kind of image and with a there's imagination to it and I watch this and like if you're gonna do this premise which is you know kind of very thin and you know obviously pretty dumb you have to develop it you have to have either better stronger set pieces or you need to actually think through the idea a little bit more in the actual kind of smart writing way that they used to do on a twilight zone episode you needed i mean it It made sense to me that this was the that this was the only original one written for the movie. This is the only one that's actually not a classic Twilight Zone episode or premise that was written by like Serling or by Richard Matheson or one of the excellent science fiction writers. And it, it felt like hubris by Landis to be like, I can write a great, you know, uh, yeah. a Twilight Zone episode. And, you know, and then obviously that hubris was also production negligence where he was like, I am going to just 
have these kids on set after hours when they are legally allowed to be here and I'm going to hide that from everyone. And yeah, you know, even, it's, it's crazy. Even the, like, as I am not as familiar with the twilight zone, but I, I, you know, I've seen parodies enough and I've probably seen a couple episodes to know the, the general feel of what they are. And as soon as he starts talking, um, I was like, this seems way over the top for a twilight zone story. And uh, also just the pacing of it, like the amount of, slurs per second are pretty wild and it just seems so over the top and so established like how yeah, what bad a great this guy final is. image everyone gets of vic morrow eh? yeah 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 it's yeah that's i mean that's that's wild on its own too and, it and, just the, and then to leave the vietnam segment in that doesn't you didn't even get to shoot the climax sense. of it no, no it, because it's, it, it it's, because it's it, yeah. you know because because obviously you don't you can't include that footage i just don't know why this entire section wasn't scrapped and they didn't reshoot something else especially if you're not even there's not even yeah. a dedication or a memorial to morrow so i'm like also no, they like, just put the what? twilight zone music in at the end it's it's uh it's like it's really crazy i, I wonder if children, part of it yeah. was that they were they were hoping that the movie itself was going to be good enough wash away the problems that uh that they that they experienced in making it but you don't do that when when something just absolutely horrible like that happens and look i'm sure it's not like john landis is a a, a sociopathic person you know look i i believe like just in making a movie it's the same thing it's like you see someone who who commits decisions that are makes decisions that are not that are unwise it doesn't mean that they are evil people. I don't even think evil exists. I think horrible people are may have the capacity to be uh, to be good as well. Um, but uh, you know, th- there's something just so macabre and and uh, that feels like a Twilight Zone episode unto itself. I wish they had made something. <laughs> you can't divorce this segment. You watch it the yeah. whole time. I think I saw a friend of the pod, Will Sloan, describe it as having a stink. That it's just like you can't, you can't. Yeah, separate I wish it, they had um, done a Twilight Zone episode or uh, you know an addendum. You know, maybe the movie could have ended, and it could have been a documentary that picks up uh, with John, John Landis going through what he went through. You know, uh, sure. uh, yeah. uh, I mean, they acknowledge been, that, what happened. Like they don't, I don't, they don't even mention the children at the end of the credits. I don't believe, which is no, just wild. No. Like it, so. Yeah, it, it's there's, yeah. there's a and no good it, for sure. No good. No, they, they, I mean, they, they, they tried to blame the kids' parents in court, and oh, they tried crazy. to do all kinds of crazy there was shit. One we point we can't get Lan- into all of it, no, but people yeah. should read up on it. It's 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 pretty wild. But the the craziest thing I think I experienced watching this movie is I went this this sequence is not not very good. It's 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 just, just not. There's it, nothing good about it whatsoever. And then uh, it doesn't it, it it doesn't quite work. But then I then I went straight into and I was like watching it i was like wait did spielberg make the worst the worst segment i know i, know, I, was, I was just about to say it i was, I, I was like do- it can't get much worse than this and then it's like well actually it can because it's uh, it's this is uh, this felt pointless the second one with spielberg. this one i was yeah. actually shocked by i was waiting for the, the twist can, <laughs> and, and it, it's a it's a it's a remake of the same titled episode from from season three of the show written by george clayton johnson and, and richard matheson and is about a, a new resident of Sunnyvale retirement home played by Scatman Crothers, who essentially tries to convince all the other elderly folks, especially the one played by Billy Quinn, that, you know, they can still play like they can enjoy life if they if they choose to. They can play, they can dance, they can fantasize. And this is, I think, arguably maybe the worst thing I've ever seen Spielberg direct, to be honest. Yeah, it's just it like it it is. Like primarily it's shot in this like warm orange glow of like a whimsical historical drama. It's very talky. The blocking is incredibly boring. The camera work for him. I was like, what is going on? The use of like shadows when they do the transformation in the yard and everything. And it was actually so I didn't get really what it was going for to the point where it made me go back and watch the episode that it was adapting to like see if I could figure out what choices were being made and they just confirmed to me that I went oh why why did you do that I like it might I I, I read that maybe he abandoned the production after 
after uh, that's his the excuse for happened, sure. Like right? that, that, that's yeah. what he says. Like he says that obviously Spielberg was one of the ones who was very outspoken. He was entirely outraged about you know what John Landis had been involved in, and he basically says that his heart was not in this. He shot his contract his four contractual days and didn't do any additional work or any planning for this. He just came in and worked the days he was required to because he had already signed everything and he was a producer on it and everything like that. And he just so that's that that's what he he says you partially believe him because it came out between et and temple of doom so like the guy was he in was terms of fire, directing genre set yeah. yeah he was at he was on his fucking game yeah. in this era so it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that he makes the worst thing he's ever made and it comes at a you know it's not related to that that would be yeah. a little shocking to me but also uh, whoever wrote it because I, I i don't maybe it was richard matheson but i couldn't figure out what the hell they were thinking because when I went to the original one, the whole section of that, it's the exact same premise. It's like an old guy who teaches all the other old people that if they become like young at at heart and in mind again, they can actually transform into kids and have a second life. And they, they do do that in the original short, but it's actually left ambiguous whether it's actually the old people or not. It's basically, it, it takes the perspective <laughs> of like the curmudgeonly guy and it's he such a goes out strange- position to take inside the thing and there's something bizarre in the casting of the british man with the cane um uh, for some reason the child who's playing him is so much older than the other kids yeah (laughs) that was the um, uncanny thing having the kids actually do the old people voices which is something they don't do in the original show because the whole point is you're meant to be a little bit unsure whether this old guy is just like thinking that those kids are all of his like elderly retirement friends who have found an escape and aren't taking them like him with them and it's actually left like to the point where he's just like you know take me with you she's shouting at these kids and these kids look confused like they're like are they just normal kids who an old man is shouting at and the the supernatural hint comes at the very very end because at the end of the episode the guy goes oh all the old people are gone so they maybe they did turn into kids and run away but it's it's a mystery and it actually is like creepy it's like creepy watching this old guy be like are those my friends they're not responding to me like they're my friends but he just said they'd all turn into kids and now there's a bunch of kids outside and they're missing and like that's the tone of that original episode and in this it's like this sentimental drivel where like it's the end like of a they, Spielberg movie, but you don't get any it, of the it, other it, stuff. <laughs> he, yeah, he he was like, "What if a Twilight Zone episode was more like Hook?" Which yeah. is, I think, the worst idea someone's ever had. Yeah, the um, guy is essentially and, Peter Pan at the end, where he's like, "I'm going out the is. window and I'm flying, and you can't come with." Except and he's the music like, you can't come and everything. Me, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it it swells. He's he's kind of like you know, longing to be young again. He learns to be young again. He's kicking the can at the end in this kind of happy go lucky, bright, sunny afternoon. Um, yeah, it just feels, it felt like alone that if you like sentimental stuff, maybe this would work for you, but it felt so especially out of place in the twilight zone movie when everything else is at least trying to have with everyone else's tone. Maybe he was trying to do something different or not, but regardless, I just, it really doesn't, uh, work. It's so cloying. It's so, it does feel like he's on autopilot and it doesn't make any context with the, or in the spirit of the rest of the segments. And it wraps up real uh, quickly too. It's very strange. Like they just turn and then they play some some hide and seek and then they're like oh i don't have a place to stay make me old again and then they just kind of remember being young it, it, it's just not a lot and then the one honestly. old guy who was grumpy is like you know what what if i could play like a kid again that would be nice i was like it's such a, like it just it's, it's literally it doesn't simple. it doesn't like, feel like a twilight zone thing at all yeah i i totally agree um, so we were 40 minutes into the movie and I was like, what has Lance done? <laughs> <Yeah>. Lance. <laughs> just trolling you guys. I, I was shouting Lance's name into the air. Why? I was like, ex- uh, explain yourself. And what then like a, in a rare burst of genuine movie magic, yes. I was like, we have two more segments left. And I was like, they're both fantastic out of nowhere. I was like, hold And I mean, not out of nowhere. They're great directors. But the Joe Dante segment is such a crazy ratchet up in quality that I actually got whiplash. I was like, <laughs> yeah. wait, I, I I actually had to start. I was like, I was, I was zoning out a little myself bit. It was <laughs> that good. Like I was like, no, this is probably not as good as I think it is. But it, it just it is. But you're so used to being kind of. Yeah, it's it's. 
there's a dull down in the first 40. So yeah, now now it helps that Joe Dante here is working with one of the great, you know, like he is remaking one of the like famously great yeah. episodes of the show with a really great premise. But I also want to highlight the fact that um, Dante is also one of the few guys really making hit his, his own. He actually took the same basic premise, which is that all of these adults would be scared of this child with powers who can, you know, kill them or hurt them with with, with his mind and the way that those adults would behave around a kid. Like it's it, there's something creepy about that. But he does it in this very, very style, the style specific to him where it's very demented and unsettling. And it's like the, you know, this it's a violent cartoon, essentially, where this kid who has godlike powers, he's also based them on what he's learned watching like old golden age cartoons sort of slapstick anarchy that, you know, he would develop in his in his Gremlins movies. And uh, this one I just thought was fantastic. I mean, I like seeing Dick Miller pop up oh, yeah. as the guy at Always. the bar. Kathleen Quinlan, uh, who's from the Sleazoids classic Breakdown from 1997, mm-hmm. uh, is is in here as the teacher who like meets this young precocious kid and eventually discovers that he is this kind of carry style telepath with very scary powers to you know essentially do whatever he wants to any adult who who annoys him simply by um, wishing it. Uh, but what I really loved massive child stunt where he gets hit by a car. He, oh my god! It's yes, actually such yes. a wild shot. I was like, I, I, it just looks like a child getting hit by a car straight up. I, it might be, to be honest. John Dante, don't don't do that to us, man. We don't need yeah, that. Yeah, no, as no, well. no, 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 another one. Jesus yeah. Christ! <laughs> that is there is something weird about the beginning of this segment. I mean, look, I, I I've chose this whole thing to talk about because I I I um both the original Twilight Zone episode and this uh, remake, which has a lot of um, things that I think are really cool. I think both Joe Dante and George Miller found like a kind of new ways to like get outside the language of a typical Twilight Zone episode. And really Mm -hmm. what what Joe Dante does is he like almost creates a real life Looney Tunes uh, Mm -hmm. artistic, his artistic approach with it is so disturbed. And he's able to obviously take all of his uh, love of animatronic monsters and creatures. And oh, he makes like every the production all. design of it's, the it's house. It's amazing. But the reason oh I was just God. so interested in it is because I remember like in my first days in being in Texas when I was with George and I was at the Ren Fair. I remember just thinking and you kind of get a little bit of it in the first episode of the series uh, of Ren Fair is this dimension how every person, um, you know, even this one woman in the show, she goes every day I pray to two things in my life. God and King George. <laughs> Every person you see that's around George has the same sort of fawning over quality that this uh, boy, uh, ha- you know, is, is engenders with his family. Uh, every person right. is a, a, a yes man. They, uh, yeah, the they way they're so exaggeratedly friendly and afraid to like step out of line or challenge him or upset him in any way because so the kid they might turn on them. Of him, and and it's like a, it's it's a very telling. I don't know. There's there's just something that I, I found um, in a way probably a bit more uh, prophetic or something that in the original Twilight Zone episode. I mean, there, th- this, I think there's some great stuff in it. There's some strange uh, qualities in just watching it back. Like at the beginning, uh, when she's at the, 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 the diner and she meets him and the kid's getting bullied, but yet he doesn't seem to do anything to those kids that are fucking with him for some reason, mm-hmm. unless I missed something. Um, Besides, it's, and then, it might imply yeah. that he's messing up their their. Uh, Because they're watching sports or something like that, and he's messing up the TV screen. That could be what he's doing, but it it, just what we see later on. You think his retaliation would be much stronger than that? Yeah, yeah. It's very, um, and you know, the only other thing I'd say, I think it's meant to imply he doesn't use it much outside the house Mm, in the same way that the family that he controls, that the kid from the original show does it to like everybody like the whole the whole town is like a cult surrounding this kid where anyone who steps at a line i do love that in the original too they send them to the cornfield and oh, there's yeah. a cr- horribly creepy image where he turned the six-year-old kid like turns this guy who's like you know he doesn't like music the kid doesn't like music so none of the adults can play music and they start literally <laughs> sweating and losing their minds because they can't like just even enjoy their birthday and like sing happy birthday to a guy <laughs> and the guy freaks out at him and so the kid turns him into a jack-in-the-box this is a horrible <laughs> image of like the shadowy jack-in-the-box going back and forth oh, and then man. they all beg him please send him to the cornfield and that's so that he sends all of their you know transformed bodies to die in the cornfield and all of the adults like the guy's wife is just screaming in the background while this kid turns him into a jack-in-the-box and Holy transports hell. him to a cornfield it's, it's, no, it's pretty it's, dark it's, it's effective it's probably more effectively scary than than this one although there are moments in this the colors 
The other thing I always would dream the of. The slow burn fashion I, of this, though, I really enjoyed. Yeah, like, I liked the way it. That, I liked the, it. The way that the teacher slowly figures out, like, th- that ominous thing where she's walking through the hallway where I love they're that. watching even the, the Bimbo's eye, initiation. Yeah, yeah and, and the, the, the tilt the, to reveal that the one sister in the dark has no mouth because, like, the kid has wished true. her mouth away so she doesn't speak. Like, that's such a horrible thing. Yeah, the, the shot. weird, like, hall of, hall of mirrors. The only thing oh, yeah. I also say about this one that I, I, I can't. Um, I I just I want to know why the end <laughs> the ending of this one is so strange. It's a little she's tell- different. Yeah. She um it reminds me of this movie, The Blank Check, the Disney original <laughs> movie that I grew up watching. <laughs> I remember Jamie's thinking, favorite movie. Oh you heard that God, laugh, right? I've got almost like a near viral post about that movie. That's so funny. Well, oh, did you? Did, the just the post of yeah, the ending, isn't it? It's so, it's so similar to this, isn't yeah. it? It's like a, it's like basically um, <laughs> uh, a, a movie that condones. Hey, now she's pedophilia. just a school teacher who's going to teach him how to control his powers. It's the happy ending of Carrie. Okay, she there's nothing else him, going on you, there. I will be your teacher <laughs> and your student. It's this strange. Oh, it's boy. like what is what is going? What's what is fucking going on? What? what what is happening and why, why is she, I mean, maybe, maybe I was like, maybe she wants to take him to uh, solve homelessness in America. Look, you're you not know, supposed to be thinking about that. You're supposed to be thinking about, <laughs> dude, look at that crazy bunny rabbit. He pulled out of a hat that turned into a crazy animatronic gremlin that started attacking everyone. You know, like Absolutely. that's what you're supposed to leave this one thinking. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe I, I, I couldn't help but just think uh, this was, this is uh, not what I ever imagined. This was going to go. Yeah, he, he might, he might've uh, needed a couple more. He might've needed a feature length movie to develop the idea of here's the school teacher who's actually going to raise this kid right and not just bow to every whim and be like it's hamburgers and candy apples for dinner every night and we're actually going to let get this kid a normal life somehow which i think it is meant to be kind of sweet in that way and but there is there is a dimension to it where it happens very quickly um that you're just kind of like uh yeah i don't know but Either way, I do think that the Dante one is leagues uh, stronger, even just on a purely visual and and directing level in terms of how he turned it into with the Dutch angles and the colors and the production design and the makeup effects. Like the way that he turns it into one of those golden age cartoons, but in this expressionist horror kind of thing, kind of fashion. Yeah, and the it's there's horrible textures in it. That crazy shot that makes it, I think, to one of the the alternate art where she opens the door. There's a giant eyeball there. Oh yeah, and there's some. Really, really effective um, imagery, which I would also say, too, uh, about the the fourth segment, the George Miller one, which is interesting because um, it is actually the one where if you're to compare it to the original segment actually is the most faithful in an almost like shot for shot kind of way, because Joe Dante's. It's his own spin in terms of his own aesthetic interests and cartoons yeah. and getting into that anarchic sort of like gremlins, monsters kind of stuff. His is like that's a Joe Dante twist on a Twilight Zone classic. Because the classics like more that, like it sounded like, like Village of the Damned or something like that in that tone. Almost, yeah. almost. And and so but the George Miller directed one here. He is uh, adapting Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, which is a remake of a classic Richard Matheson episode, actually based on one of his short stories. And it is a, a twisted take on like the the boy who cried wolf. That's essentially the sweaty, sweaty, nervous breakdown suffering man cries gremlin on an airplane is like, I guess what it is. And it's John, John Lithgow is in the William Shatner role as this like scared pill popping passenger having a panic attack due to his fear of flying that makes all the other passengers and stewardesses like not believe him when he swears that there's a slimy green gremlin man on the wing getting struck (laughs) by lightning and like throwing debris and into the the engine and i just thought that man it it, like miller just absolutely directs the fuck out of this one like that this is if you like the original episode it is almost the same thing in some cases shot for shot like the framing of the way that he helplessly looks out that plane window and sees like a little creature fucking with the wing those like long shots which are great um those shots are literally ripped from the thing and william shatner is framed in the exact same way looking at the exact same wing with a guy on it at the end and like and it even has the same like the way he hangs out of it with the gun and shoots at him it's beat for beat it's the same thing but miller updates it definitely with uh some like 80s makeup effects and some mm-hmm. of that like sweaty intensity and 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 paranoia like lithgow so good at doing wide eyed at wide eyed anxiety and and hysterics and miller is so use so athletic in his use of that like confined 
chamber um, setting of just like this plane, you know, uh, where no one is going to escape. Like it's claustrophobic from the very first frame when he's even oh, just yeah. trapped himself in the in, in, in the bathroom. And then when he's in his seat and everyone is staring at him and everyone is sweating and like, who is this crazy guy? And every time he's like, look out the window, there's a gremlin fucking with the engine. Not a single person believes him. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's, it's a pretty fantastically directed thriller. And the performances are really fun too. I mean, obviously Lithgow is a, a, amazing. Uh, uh, I love the off kilter camera angles that come in when he's just in the bathroom sweating and you get these massive him reciting ups. stats on accident deaths while being coaxed back to his seat. And he's just like, you know, you have better chance of dying. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's amazing. And I also really loved, uh, her name's, uh, Christina uh, Negra, and uh, it's she plays the little girl, the little blonde girl that kind of messes with him a little bit. Honestly, I thought she was really natural and, and hilarious with the way that they would go back and forth. Um, as yeah, she, she's she's, she's like, you can't nervous. smoke that cigarette on this plane. He's <laughs> yeah, very upset about it. Yeah, just stuff like that. I th- I, I thought it was uh, was really fun. And then I mean, once they break into the kind of the the '80s makeup, uh, I thought it was just awesome to look at that gremlin. What do they do in the original? Is it like a puppet? essentially yeah it's the same thing okay. it actually is like almost like it almost looks like it, the, the, it's funny i think i've seen some complaints that the gremlin in on the plane in this one like looks a little uh you know maybe like not the best like puppet you know mm, work sure. um but it's very similar to what they do so i'm, I'm curious if they kind of limited themselves to you know the the, the reference also, point uh, a little bit i also love the the gremlin's attitude like he, he is obviously kind of scary in the sense that he's aggressive he's trying to kill everybody but he has a cartoonish quality to him as well like when he bites the gun in half or when he just nags at like he just points his finger and goes like "Mm -mm -mm," and then flies away like he is is kind of messing with him a little bit my favorite moment in the whole thing is when that amazing long take of Lithgow settling down and getting cozy you know getting his blanket and his pillow Mm -hmm. out and the camera slowly pushing in as he's like reassuring himself no one else saw it it's also illogical like that there's a right. naked man on the wing at 35,000 <laughs> feet. That's ridiculous. And he's, so he's getting cozy, but then he hears the knocking on the window and the tapping sounds. And Jerry Goldsmith goes fucking crazy on oh, the suspense yeah. strings on the score. And you can feel it nagging at his mind as it camera gets closer and closer till he whips the window open. The gremlins right there. And it's a blink and you miss it moment. But George Miller throws his classic. He's freaking out so bad that his eyes actually bulge out of his head. Yes. moment. And it's actually, and it's and it's Lithgow. Like it's a totally right. ridiculous cartoon animated moment. It's exactly like Toe Cutter in the first Mad Max when he realizes he's going into the grill of the truck and his eyes literally bulge out of his head as a prosthetic. Yep. If you if For you pause second. it, you will see John Lithgow doing that exact same thing when he spots that gremlin. It's just again a split second touch. Great, great moment. And yeah, and it's just it ends, amazing ends to match whole, that that energy. Like have the wide eyed of the gremlin, have the wide eyed of of Lithgow. It's just like that. That's how you know, uh, what would the, that, that's just how tense the moment is at that time. It's, it's, it's a great way of expressing it. Yeah. And it ramps up getting into a legit gunfight between L- John Lithgow breaking his way through the fucking window while the air pressure's going everywhere. Passengers <laughs> are flying out. everywhere, firing a gun at a gremlin <laughs> who then, you know, rips the gun in half, slimes his face and, and jumps off as they, you know, do their emergency landing that they're all doing and uh, waves, waves his finger at him like, you ruined my fun, man. And uh, I do like that they do replicate the same ending, too, which is that everyone's like, that dude's insane. That's crazy. What the fuck was that guy? And then the the crew actually shows up and they're like, there was physical signs of actual you know, claw yeah. gremlin tampering on the plane. And it, it, they try to cutesy circle it back around by also having him get in a straight jacket and an ambulance. And it's Dan Aykroyd from the original know, who the eats question. Albert Brooks, yeah. you know, at, you know, you want to see something really, really scary. scary. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll just tell you something really scary. The fact that you didn't put the people at the end of the movie, <laughs> and died for the making of your movie. No, no I mean, I, the, 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 the George Miller one is is is. Uh, I mean, it has all the madcap energy that that exists and and makes his filmmaking so like uh, yeah. fucking yeah. pure viscous, panic attack you know? kineticism. If that's what it's, you're interested it's in, it's great. It's great from the opening shot, which feels like it's riffing on like this the James uh, uh, Jesus. What's the, why am I forgetting his name? James Howe was that his name? The cinematographer on Seconds. Mm. Um, yes, oh, yeah. James Wong Howe. The 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 kind of like weird opening sequence in Seconds where you're you're uh, it's like shot through prisms and it's uh, oh yeah, face dude, that's one of my favorite movies ever. I'm looking at the one it. she right now actually. 
yeah, it's, it up it's here just, in the house. Oh wow, great great <laughs> movie. But yeah, there, there's something about the um, the the. I don't know. There's there's a lot of like fun George Miller uh, classic humor as well. The kid mm-hmm. who's taking his Polaroid pictures of a uh, John Lithgow f- losing his goddamn mind. I don't know uh, how he uh, thought he was going to get a photo of the gremlin with it though. I was like, dude, that flash is going to hit that window. Yeah, I don't know. And in all honesty, yeah. too, it was hard to see the gremlin <laughs> in moments when he is on the end of the wing to begin with. So with the great camera they have, but yeah, it's a. Uh, I do like that setup. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do like that setup though that she has it in her hand. She's looking through her photos and then it's a moment where maybe he can try to prove to somebody that it's going on. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. George Miller directs the yeah, hell out of and, it. And, Lith- and Lith- Lithgow is obviously, uh, fantastic. And the, the, the effects work is, is so good. And yeah, there is, there's, there's a lot to like about these, these last two segments, but yeah. if we are maybe pivoting towards the reductive rating round on twilight zone, the movie, this is going to be the hardest reductive rating round of all time <laughs> because you, you heard us know. do it. And we were like, there's two basically pieces of garbage, <laughs> um, two bangers. It's and then so two tough. bangers and and i'm like do you just go with the objective route of it do you go well if it's two two star things and two four star things you know does that maybe make it equal <laughs> like a low three but then can you give a go low to three map. to a movie that killed three people i know yeah, um, that's the thing too i don't know that i can uh part of me feels like a, a like a two feels wrong because the dante and miller sections are very good and i think anyone who likes their movies is going to get a lot out of them and i think that those guys actually do really respect the twilight zone and as yeah. far as remaking iconic episodes of the twilight zone that could have gone so wrong but they actually do amplify and put their own spin on the style and the personality and you know so it's like i don't know part of me thinks a two is too low for those guys but a three is way too high for what spielberg and landis (laughs) are doing so i'm i'm stuck in this middle ground where i'm like but you know what also the landis and spielberg is only like 35 minutes or 40 minutes of the movie whereas the dante and miller is like an hour you know if you want to math it out a little bit but i don't know i'm 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 still a little suck i'm definitely aiming like high to maybe low three if i was feeling generous I, that's where i'm landing yeah I, th- I feel like for the first time on this show i'm doing the same thing where it's like just follow <laughs> my splitting. letterboxed and one day you'll see a rating for this thing because i i need to sleep on it because it's just the first two truly are I mean, the Spielberg's just feels completely out of place, let alone that it's boring. And then the and then, of course, everything about the first one is just bad and, and the evil background with it and everything. It just it, it's it's really hard to get behind it. And um, it colors it, it even if you don't think it will. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's the thing. And especially especially once you look into it, you're like, I went down the unfortunate rabbit hole there. And it is very, <laughs> very harrowing. It's not good. Um, so, it, yeah, I don't know. It's it, I'm, I'm going to go with the same that you're doing, Josh. I, but the last two segments, the ones with uh, by George Miller and Joe Dante, are fantastic. Great. I got to go look at the originals. And, uh, I mean, I got to just oh watch God, the whole show, honestly. Enough. Just watch um, the whole show. But it is strange to recommend half a movie. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would go like <laughs> basically go online and it, probably the segments are on YouTube somewhere. Go check out Do we out have a time two. code? Anyone have a time code? 41 minutes. Yeah, there you Click. go. That's when you, you know, that's where bam. you should start Twilight Zone the movie. Nailed 41 it. 41 minutes. Uh, so yeah, that's For that's you, Lance, I'm enough. assuming you're in a similar spot. I think I'd, I would give it the exact, that's a fair rating. <laughs> okay. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And I'm sorry to make you sit through it, but I felt like it was important. <laughs> Oh, it is. I mean, I've had this on my list forever. I'm I'm glad that I finally watched it. Um, it's just it is peculiar at times. <laughs> yeah, we, we we live by that Herzog motto of uh, "Do not avert your eyes." <laughs> yes, exactly. You know? <laughs> look at it it came out it made 42 million dollars when it came out and they didn't put the people who died in the credits uh Nuts. so <laughs> that feels yeah. like a great way to wrap up <laughs> our episode uh this week on um night riders from 1981 and twilight zone from 1983 thanks so much lance for for joining us and for bringing these films and congratulations obviously once again so much on on the show everyone should please be uh watching up and if you're looking for a companion you're like oh my god i don't have enough renaissance 
Once Fair in my life. Yes. Uh, Night Riders, George Romero has two and a half hours for you. He could not give you, I think, a better recommendation for anyone who's looking for more. But Lance, do you got anything else while you're wrapping up here? It's usually where we have a guest plug something. We've already plugged Ren Fair. Do you have, do you have, you have other movies, right? Where are they available? Oh, yeah. Where can people hey, watch them? Hey, hey. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, Sperm World is on uh, Hulu and Some Kind of Heaven, my first film. I don't know where it's available these days. Apparently, it, the Magnolia Pictures bought it. I think it's uh, it was on Hulu. I just learned it's not. I think you could rent it on Amazon <laughs> and on YouTube, and it's on some weird player I've never heard of called Zumo Play. Okay, sweet. Uh, oh, which I, I've never heard of this uh, player before, but here it is. Ooh, Zumo well, Play. for our Canadian listeners, for our Canadian listeners, uh, it's on Tubi. The People's Streaming oh, yeah. Service here the people, in, the in Canada. Service. Yes, that's right. And TV. Sperm there World is on Disney Plus here, so it's all streamable. You have no excuse. Yeah, it's everyone all, should. Uh, it's all there. Everyone should go watch Night Riders and then immediately watch Ren Fair. That would be the yes. Uh, that'd be a great Sunday. Let me tell you. We'll do it. Yes. All right. For our listeners, we are going to be back in one week's time where we are going to be over on the Patreon, and there is a new Beverly Hills Cop movie. On the way, yes. Axel Foley, Eddie Murphy is back, and we have never talked about the original Beverly Hills Cop. I actually don't think we ever even talked about Eddie Murphy on the show. No, so I don't think it so. is I haven't finally seen them, so very stoked. Yeah, it is finally time. So we're going to talk about the first Beverly Hills Cop, a really huge hit directed by Martin Bress with Eddie Murphy, and then we're going to be talking about the sequel, which, from my memory, I remember liking more uh, because yeah. partially because it is directed by Tony Scott, and I'm <laughs> yeah, a huge no Scott head. There. And the directing is just way over the top and way flashy. And it almost feels like those two personalities almost clashed on the movie a little bit. Tony Scott thought he was making something else. And then Eddie Murphy was like, no, 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 we're doing this is riff central. You don't understand. And Tony Scott was like, no, we're going back to the cars and explosions. And, you know, yeah, yeah, (laughs) that's just that's my loose memory of it anyway. So I'm excited to go back Clashing can be a glorious thing. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, so Beverly Hills Cop uh, talk next week over on the Patreon. And then in two weeks' time, we are actually going to be back with two special guests uh, where we are going to be talking about uh, uh, a transgender actress uh, by the name of Ava Robbins, who I am not familiar with. But uh, she was in one really big Dario Argento movie, one called Tenebre uh, from 1982. I wanted to watch that for a while. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about that one, and then we're going to be talking about what appears to be like a low-budget Spanish superhero comedy about like the about a transgender possibly superhero played by Ava Robbins. Uh, and I'm very curious about this. This is a kind of a territory we haven't talked about much, but our, our guests have actually will, you know, we'll, we'll tell you when we get there, wait for it. Uh, <laughs> but they, they have a new book coming out about uh, transgender representation in cinema. And this was the pairing that they selected. So I'm, you know, I haven't oh, cool. seen it. So we'll, the, the, we'll probably get a better description on thematically what they're doing or what they're trying to get at with the pairing when we uh have have them on in in two weeks time but it's a you know we're 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 stepping out we're checking out something i because this other one eva man has 93 logs on letterboxd oh wow we're going deep that's awesome we're we're going deep and we always love when a guest brings something like that on for us so definitely uh look forward to that in two weeks time but yeah that uh actually you know what i'm going to announce the third one anyway in three weeks time hell yeah there's a new there's a new twister we're working hard (laughs) There's a new Twister movie out. Uh, so we are going to be talking about the fucking cinema of Jan Dubon. Uh, yeah. Speed and Twister, baby. Oh, I can't wait for Speed. <laughs> 90s oh, I love thrillers. Speed. Let's go. Keanu, <laughs> I love you. Let's go. So that's where, that's where we're going to be going to in uh, three weeks' time over on the Patreon once again. But uh, yeah, that's going to wrap it up for everything this week. Thanks so much for listening and keep it easy. Keep it sleazy, y'all.